Jennifer Cave's family and friends are thrilled for her. She's just been hired on full-time as a secretary at an Austin law firm. Her friend, excited by the news, said, uh, hey, we should go out and celebrate. But her friend is mixing vodka and Xanax and getting out of hand. Jennifer's first shift starts in a few hours. They inform her Jennifer didn't come in, and they ask if she knows where she is. But unfortunately, she never makes it. The impact on the community and the UT community was significant. It's a tragedy that University of Texas students will talk about for years to come. When Jennifer Cave fails to show up for her first day at a new job, her parents, Jim and Sharon, worry something has happened to her. They trace her steps back to the last place they believe she was, the Orange Tree condo belonging to a friend of Jennifer's. What they find there is a parent's worst nightmare. Austin 911, Denise Philly, fire or EMS. Please, where are you? Please, where are you? Our address of the emergency. It's at Orange Tree Apartments. Sir, this is 911. We have a lot of folk on the way. I just need to be able to confirm if she is conscious and breathing. No, I think she's dead. Okay, so you, she is past, uh, you believe she's past doing CPR? I do. I do, and I also believe that we've got a crime scene here that I don't want to disturb. My name is Tina Thomas. I'm an audio journalist in Austin, Texas. I published a podcast in 2019 called The Orange Tree, uh, which covered the murder of Jennifer Cave and subsequent trials. West Campus is a series of neighborhoods that surround uh, the University of Texas at Austin. I lived there for about two years, and during that time I heard a lot about um, the murder of Jennifer Cave. August 16th, 2005, Jennifer Cave gets a call from the law firm where she interviewed. She had just found out that day that she had gotten a job at a law office. In fact, she applied for initially for a job at a law office that was a lower position than she ended up getting through the process of her interview because they liked her so much. Jennifer calls friends and family to share the good news with them while she lays out an outfit for her first day at the new job. For Jennifer's mom and stepdad, this comes as a major relief. It sounds like a step in the right direction that Jennifer needs to get her life on track. Over the past few years, Jennifer's had trouble finding her footing. After high school, she does a semester at Texas State, then decides she wants to change and ends up at Austin Community College. Jennifer grows up in the small town of Bishop, Texas, which has a population of roughly 3,000 people. Making the move to Austin, Texas feels like a long way from home. It's a big city with a thriving nightlife overflowing with college kids looking to party. It's a shock for this small town girl looking to find herself. Jim and Sharon see there's been a change in Jennifer. Sharon is especially concerned that Jennifer seems checked out from school. They fear that she's rudderless, not herself, and at risk of falling in with a bad crowd. Which is why Jim and Sharon are so relieved to hear Jennifer's great news about her new job. And so that night, after um, calling all her family and her friends to let them know the good news, her friend Colton Petaniak, excited by the news, said, uh, hey, we should go out and celebrate. Colton Petaniak was a McCombs business student at UT Austin at the time. He uh, was a, also like a small town drug dealer. During his initial years of college, he started dealing drugs out of West Campus and partying a lot, uh, as comes the territory of selling drugs. A one-time top student at his all-boys Catholic school in Little Rock, Arkansas, Colton no longer seems to care about his academic future. He abuses drugs and alcohol and parties a lot. Lately, Jennifer has put some distance between herself and Colton in an effort to get her life on track. But on the evening of August 16, 2005, 
Jennifer decides to accept Colton's invitation, and the two go out to celebrate. In Austin, especially for young people, when you go out to celebrate, you go to 6th Street. It's just a strip of bars, kind of like Bourbon Street in New Orleans. So that's where they decided to go that night. They went into Treasure Island and actually ran into a couple friends who were there for a birthday party. They remember seeing her with Colton, who was clearly very inebriated where she was not. It's getting late. Colton is intoxicated from a mix of vodka and Xanax. Jennifer will need to get home soon if she wants to be ready for her first day at her new job in the morning. The last time Colton and Jennifer are seen together by friends, Colton is upset because he can't find his phone, and Jennifer is trying to help him. The group of friends head to another bar and lose track of the pair at this point. The next morning, August 17, 2005, Jennifer fails to show up for the first day at her new job. Sharon gets a phone call from the law office where Jennifer is supposed to start. They inform her Jennifer didn't come in, and they ask if she knows where she is. Sharon is distraught and calls her daughter. She wasn't picking up her phone, uh, and she never really did that, especially like at this point in her life, she was being really responsible and um, getting back to people, so that seemed like odd behavior for her mother and her, her family. So at the point um, that Sharon Cave realized that something was going on when uh, her daughter wasn't picking up her phone. The whole situation immediately sets off alarm bells for Sharon. She's worried something has happened to Jennifer. And since her daughter is on her phone plan, Sharon quickly gets a log of all the numbers Jennifer has recently called. Sharon speaks to a friend of Jennifer's named Michael, who claims he spoke to Jennifer the previous night. Jennifer tells him she has a friend who's having issues and agrees to hang out with him. Michael tells Sharon the friend's name is Colton. Sharon finds Colton's number in Jennifer's call log. She calls him, but he denies having seen her the previous night. Something doesn't add up. Colton's been getting calls all afternoon from family and friends who know that he was with Jennifer the night before, and that's the last person that anyone saw Jennifer with, up until she didn't show up to her first day of her new job. Sharon gets back in touch with Michael, who insists that Colton and Jennifer were together the previous night. She keeps Michael on the phone while she tries Colton again on another phone. Colton is irritated and tells Sharon he hasn't seen Jennifer and he doesn't know where she is. Michael knows that Colton is lying, but why? What is he hiding? Jennifer Cave grows up in the small Texas town of Bishop and eventually moves to the big city of Austin, where she struggles with school and friends. Jennifer has problems finding her footing. Her parents are worried that she doesn't care about college and doesn't know what she wants in life. She's involved with some bad influences, like her friend Colton. Jennifer's parents see her turning her life around when she lands a job as a law secretary. But the night before her first shift, she agrees to go out with friend Colton. She never shows up for work the next day. Sharon has been calling around, trying to get hold of Jennifer without luck. According to her friends, she was last seen with Colton. But when Sharon calls Colton, he denies having seen her. Sharon and Jim decide to call 911 to report Jennifer missing. Since Jennifer was technically an adult, there was no way for them to file a missing persons report yet. Uh, they have to wait the certain amount of time before they could do that, and an official missing persons report can be filed. The next day, August 18th, Sharon and Jim still hadn't heard from Jennifer. They could wait no longer. No one was really giving her any answers, especially uh, not the person Jennifer was last seen with, Colton Tanya. She got really worried. Jim and Sharon decided to drive up to Austin and check in on her. 
As Jim and Sharon make the three-hour drive from Corpus Christi to Austin, they call 911 again. Sharon speaks to the Austin Police Department and explains the situation. While it's still too early to file a missing persons report, Sharon describes Jennifer's behavior as out of the ordinary, and the detective deems it worth following up on. An officer is sent to check out Colton's place. His car is parked in its space, but there's no response at his suite. For now, there isn't much she can do. Later that day, Jim and Sharon arrive in Austin. After not finding Jennifer or any trace of her, where she would normally be, her apartment or elsewhere, they end up going to Colton's apartment. It's the first stop they make, actually, because um, Jennifer's roommate, Denise Winterbottom, said that she wasn't there at their apartment. So they head to the source of where they last know Jennifer to have been with Colton. They knock at Colton's condo. There's no answer. They try the police again and explain that Jennifer's car is here, but they still haven't been able to get in touch with her. They are told that there is no probable cause at this point to enter Colton's apartment. And for now, there's nothing more to do than wait. They end up knocking on the door for several hours, looking for a sign of any movement inside, just anyone around, in and around, that knows uh, where Jennifer is, but they can't get any information still, um, and the door is locked. Uh, it seems to be dead bolted. And they know that because they call someone to try to come unlock it for them. They call a locksmith and they can't get in because it's dead bolted from the inside. So their next step is to just look for any way to try to get in there. They see a little crack in um, the outside window. And Jim and Sharon have the idea of maybe opening the window through that crack. Jim goes and gets a piece of a pair of sunglasses from the car. And he uses that to basically crack open the window and uh, unlock it from the inside. He instructs Sharon to wait outside. He knows he may be in danger. He climbs inside and once he's there, he's just trying to get through the darkness and the clutter. He describes walking through the small condominium, yelling out loud, trying to make his presence known. If there's anyone in there, to let them know that he is coming in, that he's uh, Jennifer's stepfather, and that he's not trying to harm anyone. He's just trying to look for Jennifer. But no one's answering. It's dark, and there's no sign of movement. And that's when he starts to smell something uh, coming from the bathroom that she doesn't really know his way around this condominium, but he's drawn to the bathroom because of the smell. What Jim discovers inside Colton's apartment shakes him to his core. He's barely able to convey to Sharon that there is a dead body inside, and he thinks it may be Jennifer. Austin 911, Denise Police, fire or EMS. Please hurry, please hurry. Address of the emergency. It's at Orange Street Apartments. <laughs> Sir, this is 911. We have a lot of hope on the way. I just need to be able to confirm if she is conscious and breathing. No, I think she's dead. Okay, so you, she is past, uh, you believe she's past doing CPR? I do. I do, and I also believe that we've got a crime scene here that I don't want to disturb. With police on the way, Sharon and Jim may finally be able to answer the question of what happened to Jennifer. But new questions begin to form. What happened to Colton? And where is he? An officer arrives at the condo to discover a grisly crime scene. He finds the body of a young woman in the bathtub. It is partially dismembered, missing both the head and the hands. Officer Barbaria notices a bloody hacksaw. He sees a plastic garbage bag near the tub, and given the shape of it, he knows what's inside. Who is capable of doing something like this, and why? While the primary crime scene is located in the bathroom, investigators discover what are likely bloodstains in several other areas of the condo. They also discover the likely murder weapon, a 9mm handgun, as well as two shell casings. 
Whoever did this didn't make much of an attempt to clean up afterwards. Nevertheless, at this point in the investigation, there's many more questions and answers, so they must be thorough in cataloging the evidence. Given that Golden's condo is so close to campus, students are rattled by the fact that a murder has occurred so close to home. But for now, details of the grisly crime are withheld. The body is identified as Jennifer Cave. The cause of death is from a 9mm bullet that passes through Jennifer's arm and lodges in her aorta, stopping her heart and causing near-instant death. But a second bullet is fired. It's difficult to describe and impossible to comprehend, but a second bullet from the same gun was discovered in the severed head of Jennifer Cave. The bullet entered the area of the stem of her neck and lodged in her skull, indicating that it was fired after she was already dead. Whatever the reason for doing this, it may present investigators with a glimpse into the psyche of her killer. Detectives are intentionally withholding the details of the crime from the press. They fear that if the public knew, imposters would come forward and claim responsibility. Anytime you have a murder like this, it tends to draw out some very depraved individuals, attention seekers, all who want to take credit for it. Detective David Fugit is assigned to the case. His main priority right now is tracking down Colton for questioning. One of the detectives who was really following this, who was in charge of tracking down Colton, actually had kind of an easy time pinpointing him at the time because uh, Colton never turned his cell phone off. The cell phone trace shows that Colton is in Piedras Negras, Mexico, but pings from cell phone towers aren't useful in pinpointing someone's exact location. If he has any hope of extraditing Colton and getting to the bottom of what happened to Jennifer Cave, he'll need to coordinate with local authorities. Jennifer Cave is drawn to the troubled, self-destructive persona of her friend Colton. Jennifer's stepfather, Jim, describes this as the, quote, stray dog theory, a pull to help the wayward, the down and out. But since high school, Jennifer herself has been without much in the way of purpose or direction. But Jennifer seems about to turn her life around with a full-time job at a law office where she's excited to start work. Only Jennifer never shows up to work. And in their search to find their daughter, Jim and Sharon are led back to Colton's Orange Tree condo, where they find Jennifer's body in the bathtub. Now detectives are desperate to speak to Colton and get to the bottom of what happened. But they'll need to find him first. While detectives are busy trying to track down Colton, they get a call from the parents of Laura Hall. Laura's parents have received some cryptic emails from their daughter saying that she's gone to Mexico and she doesn't plan on coming back. Investigators' lone fugitive theory is about to go out the window. Colton Pitaniak is in Mexico, and he's not alone. Laura Hall was a student at UT as well. By all accounts, including her own, she had a huge crush on Colton. Uh, she liked him a lot, and she was hoping to pursue a romantic relationship, something more serious uh, than he had in mind at the time. While he's not yet sure how she's involved, Fugit is now looking for Laura Hall and her green Cadillac. Footage is captured of uh, Laura and Colton crossing the border. At the checkpoint where they cross into Mexico, you see footage of Laura and Colton uh, handing over their IDs to officials. The drive is pretty long, but Laura seems to have driven the whole way, and Colton in the passenger seat was still trying to stay as drunk as possible and still taking a lot of Xanax. Detective Fugit now has concrete proof that Laura Hall is involved and that she and Colton have fled to Mexico. Detectives 
already have a mountain of questions for Colton, but more questions are raised as to how and why Laura Hall is involved and what role, if any, did she play in Jennifer Cave's murder. Meanwhile, nearly four hours away, Colton and Laura Hall are holed up at a hotel in the Mexican city of Piedras Negras. So after making their way into Mexico, Colton and Laura are hiding out at a hotel. And uh, it's at that time they're, they're really paranoid. Uh, Colton is still drinking and, and doing a lot of drugs. They end up befriending the hotel manager, Pedro Fernandez. He invited Colton over actually to watch mixed martial arts on his television. Colton and Laura accept Pedro's invitation to watch a fight at his place. Colton is very inebriated, but still paranoid. When this happens is kind of when things begin to unravel. When he notices that Laura and Colton uh, are displaying kind of odd behavior, he gets a little suspicious. Colton and Laura openly ask the hotel manager about extradition laws, about selling Laura's car, and suggest they can't go back to the U.S. Well, naturally, that sets off a lot of red flags. And during this time, when Laura and Colson are over at his place, kind of partying, watching mixed martial arts with Pedro, is when that infamous photo is taken of Laura and Colton by Pedro's child's playpen, smiling ear to ear, holding a stuffed animal. It's described that, you know, Colton is really paranoid, very somber and stressed out, but this photo tells a completely different story of how they were feeling at the time. Detective Fugit has yet to learn Laura's motive for aiding Colton. But given the high media profile of this case, he is eager to get the two in custody. Yes, the media was really all over this case, and particularly the story about Colton and Laura going to Mexico and being in hiding for a few days. That's when the media scrutiny was very high. The hotel manager continues to be suspicious of the odd American couple he's just had over to watch the fight. So he speaks to a friend in the border patrol and learns of a murder that recently happened in Austin. He reaches out to Detective Fugit and sends him the photo of Colton and Laura, as well as the location of the hotel they are staying at. Thanks to the hotel manager, detectives are able to narrow their search and locate Laura and Colton. They get in touch with Mexican law enforcement who are eager to cooperate with U.S. authorities. On August 23, 2005, five days after the murder of Jennifer Cave, the pair of fugitives are arrested in their hotel room by Mexican authorities. Laura and Colton are separated and interrogated, but because they only have an arrest warrant for Colton, they let Laura go. Investigators present Colton with what they know about the case. There's a mountain of evidence against Colton, so they, they're hopeful that he'll cooperate. But Colton is afraid to talk without his lawyer. Are you telling me that you don't want to talk to me and you want an attorney? I'm going to do an attorney. Either you want to talk to us today, uh, with, okay. and obviously there's no attorney I'm present. No, okay. Attorney. All right, then, then we can't talk to you, and we'll just go with the information that we have. Fujit must terminate the interview. He'll have to wait a little longer to find out what happened to Jennifer that fateful night. Detective Fugit learns his prime suspect in Jennifer Cave's murder, Colton Petoniak, has fled to Mexico with friend Laura Hall. Colton and Laura are arrested in their hotel room in Mexico five days after Jennifer Cave's murder. Laura is released and Colton is held. He refuses to speak to police without his attorney. Assistant District Attorneys Bill Bishop and Stephanie McFarland are assigned to Jennifer's case. The main facts of their case are simple. Jennifer was found in Colton's apartment. The gun that killed her belonged to Colton. His fingerprints are all over the weapon. Add this to the fact that he fled to Mexico, and the case seems pretty cut and dried. But the DA has learned that Colton's parents have hired legendary defense attorney Roy Minton, and they wonder what sort of defense he could possibly be mounting. 
but they're ready for a fight. Roy Minton is known for taking on hard cases, but he's also a pragmatist. He and his partner, Sam Bassett, must carefully comb the details of the case, making educated guesses at how the state will come after their client and ultimately form a defense that might reasonably stand up in court. My name's Sam Bassett. I've been practicing law in Austin, Texas for 32 years. I specialize in criminal defense, and uh, I represented Colton Petoniak at the time of his trial. This case was certainly the most high-profile case I had been involved in. There was quite a bit of publicity in Austin, in the Austin area, and throughout the state, and perhaps nation. One of their big hurdles is that Colton's substance abuse has created massive gaps in his memory. And without witnesses, the case will eventually come down to the physical evidence, mainly the handgun that is fired, causing Jennifer's death. I think that the impact on the community and the UT community was significant. Colton was not the type of person that would usually be accused of committing some sort of crime like this. He was a, a good student, he had been in a fraternity, and a lot of people were scratching their heads in the UT community about what, what had happened, why it ha had happened. With questions still lingering on all sides of this case, the day of Colton's trial arrives. Jennifer's family and the community at large are hopeful that this trial will finally provide answers for what happened to Jennifer Cave and why. The judge makes the surprising decision to allow Court TV Network to televise the proceedings. This very public case will now be available in real time to a shocked and curious public audience. In this case, the Court TV camera was set up literally in the middle of the gallery and it was a very large camera. Under the rules, the jurors couldn't be photographed and witnesses who did not want to be photographed were excluded. But it was a very dominating influence in the courtroom. So it was a, a, a very uh, significant part of what was going on inside the courtroom. In the public eye, Colton is already guilty. But the question that people want answered is why he did it and why he dismembered Jennifer's body the way he did. For the state, however, the burden of proof lies only in demonstrating that Colton did, in fact, murder Jennifer. The question of why he did it is not necessary to answer. Colton's lawyers offer a rather surprising plea. They are not going to contest that Colton killed Jennifer, but they are asking that the charge of involuntary manslaughter be considered in this case. In the opening statement, we addressed our theory of the case at that time. And the theory was that because of the manner in which Jennifer was shot under the arm on the side and the kind of random nature of the bullet going across her body and actually piercing her aorta, which was a very long shot type of situation, uh, combined with everything we had learned from witnesses, all that information we compiled and had to come up with a strategy to defend him against the charge of murder. In Colton's trial, he came out initially uh, and due to the advice of his lawyers said, I did this, I did kill Jennifer, but it was unintentional. Based on the information we had, we concluded that the theory of the accident fueled by intoxication was the most credible theory that we could go on in defending Colton. The state also brings up that this wasn't the first time a gun went off in Colton's apartment. He was known for playing around with guns a lot because he was selling drugs and he wanted to have this like hardcore image of him as a, as a gangster. So um, they bring up a specific instance of him playing with a gun and it accidentally firing and shooting his dishwasher. But ultimately, the judge decides against allowing the jury the charge of a lesser offense. He denied our request, and I think this jury would have struggled if they had the option of manslaughter versus murder. The trial doesn't last long. Colton's defense is limited in its options, as Colton has admitted to killing Jennifer. Their only hope is to paint a picture of a man who was not aware of what he was doing and hope for leniency in the sentencing. Essentially, Colton's lawyers were just trying to get him a lighter sentence. They were trying to get him some sympathy from the jury uh, by showcasing that he didn't remember any of that night, that he was so barred out on Xanax 
uh, had taken so many pills and drank so much that whole day that there's no possible way he could have intentionally uh, killed this friend that he initially set out to celebrate her success with. Minton allows Colton to testify in his own trial, a rarity for someone accused of murder. Minton doesn't go easy on his client. His tactic is to show that there are serious gaps in Colton's memory and that Colton likely misfired the gun that killed Jennifer by accident. I think the most compelling witness was Colton Petaniak, and, and I think he was uh, being truthful. Uh, I don't think he remembered what happened. And I know that that's, a lot of people have criticized him and us for testifying to that, but I think he was telling the truth. They also tried to show that the gun didn't have an unusually hair trigger type of pressure point. It is something that we had had our own ballistics expert look at to see what the pull ratio was on the gun to determine if, for instance, if that would have been consistent with our theory of an accident. It wasn't ruled out by ballistics that it could have been an accident, but it was also pretty solid evidence that the gun didn't have an unusually light pressure trigger. For Colton's attorneys, their only real hope is to try to convince jurors that Colton shot Jennifer by accident and that the ensuing dismemberment was the suggestion of Laura Hall. Colton is seen at a hardware store on August 17, 2005 at approximately 2.34 p.m. He has with him a shopping list. He purchases a hacksaw and some cleaning supplies. His defense alleges that he was still intoxicated at the time and that Laura Hall came up with the shopping list and the plan to cut off Jennifer's body. Minton suggests that Colton is so messed up on prescription drugs and alcohol that he can't think for himself and that Laura, a young woman completely in love and obsessed with him, did all the decision making, including the decision to flee to Mexico. But for those hoping to hear Laura's side of the story, they are left in the dark. Laura Hall showed up because we subpoenaed her to the courtroom. Uh, and that after that, she asserted her Fifth Amendment privilege and did not testify. The jury reviews the facts of the case and comes to a unanimous decision. Colton ends up being charged with murder, um, which is a 55-year sentence in his case. At the back of the courtroom sits Colton's accomplice, Laura Hall whose own road to justice is about to be paved. On August 17, 2005, Jennifer Cave is brutally murdered at the Orange Tree Condos in Austin, Texas. And the primary suspect, Colton Petoniak, flees to Mexico with friend Laura Hall. Colton is tried for Jennifer's murder and found guilty. He is sentenced to 55 years in prison. But Laura Hall's ordeal is just beginning. Laura Hall is brought in on charges of harboring a fugitive and tampering with evidence. What was most disturbing was there was medical examiner evidence that after the head had been decapitated from the body, that a bullet had been shot up through the neck and the bullet was lodged in the top of the skull. So there was a post-mortem shooting of the head of Jennifer Cave's body. That was shocking to the medical examiner, and I think it was shocking to everybody involved in the case. How could somebody do something like that? It was certainly our theory that that was done by Laura. Officer Mark Gilchrist wants to give Laura the opportunity to explain herself. But when it appears she may not be willing to cooperate, he informs her that she's under arrest. You, you don't want to talk to me without your attorney. That's what Absolutely you're telling me. Not. Okay. I mean, in the, you know, I don't know. If you're saying I might be in some kind of trouble. Read that. Oh, my God. Laura Ashley Hall, you are under arrest for okay. hindering apprehension. Hindering apprehension? Yes, ma'am. Now you understand how you, serious okay. this is? Oh my god. Okay. What's gonna happen? You're gonna go to jail. What did I? <laughs> you gotta tell the truth. Laura decides to waive her right to an attorney and cooperate with detectives. But 
her story of what happens and her involvement in it changes wildly. At one point, she claims Colton tells her he is attacked. He said that three people came into his apartment. One of them was Jen. They had guns. He said that, well, he didn't say one of them was Jen, but he said, like, one of them was, you know, one of them was her, right? He said he left the door unlocked, and they came in shooting at him. But there's no evidence to back this claim, and Laura admits this was unlikely. Laura changes her testimony from she felt scared and threatened by Colton to she was in love with him and didn't believe he committed the crime. I just didn't... couldn't fathom his guilt. And I wanted... I wanted to be able to help him in any way I could. Detectives are left without a clear picture of Laura's involvement. One thing, however, is clear. Laura's DNA is found throughout the condo, including on the murder weapon, the 9mm handgun that killed Jennifer Cave. The question that most people hope will be answered through Laura's trial was who mutilated the body and why. But this question is never answered. During Colton's trial, he claims he doesn't remember what happened, and Laura claims she had nothing to do with it even though her DNA can be found on several pieces of evidence. Laura ends up being charged and sentenced five years for hindering apprehension and tampering with evidence. That's simply because it was the maximum that she could really get for those two things that really were the only things that they could use to charge her with. While in prison, Laura appeals her case. While Laura was uh, in prison serving the first part of her initial sentence, she actually spent a lot of that time talking to her friends and family from jail phones. Um, and all those phone calls get recorded. And so, you know, lawyers will tell you, hey, if they're still gonna take something to trial, don't say anything that maybe will be inflammatory or can be used against you. Oh, that dead girl's mom sounded like a real moron. She's mad because I have a daughter and you're not dead. She doesn't have a daughter. And yeah, so she's dead. jealous. Maybe I'm she's going to stab him to death. Everybody knows, like, I'm going to be okay because I'm going home in mid-March, like, it's official. Well, Tell me I you're not going to piss on my good fortune. Well, it's probably going to happen that way, Laura. I'll kill you. Well, I hope you don't. Laura said a lot of things that were pretty damning to her friends and family, and uh, a lot of that was used in her second trial. They had an interview with that, that girl's mother again. Which oh, is, she's, I don't she's, even... she's going down. She's going yeah. down, one way or another. That she's going to pay, she's going down. It was something that kind of shocked the whole courtroom, was hearing Laura's jail phone calls. It was definitely something that added to the, the picture that the state was trying to paint of, of Laura being uh, someone that would be able to do something that was this heinous. As a result, uh, Laura's sentence was doubled from five to 10 years. What right do they have to make these decisions? They're ruining my life. What right do they have to do this? Our constitution gives them that right? No, no, I can't believe that. This is not my America. Over the years, several individuals come forward and sign affidavits stating Laura claims that she killed Jennifer. One of them is Laura's cellmate. It's been uh, shown uh, in all of the actual innocence cases we've seen in the last 10 or 20 years that jailhouse informants are some of the most unreliable witnesses uh, both for the prosecution and for the defense. So if you're, if you're basing your defense solely on jailhouse informants, you're kind of grasping. And that was one of our concerns about using the single person from the jail that we had interviewed as, as a defense to Colton by pointing the finger at Laura. Colton's appeals never amount to anything, and Colton is still serving his 55-year sentence. They do, however, continue to cast a shadow over Laura's life. Laura was released on March 15, 2018, after having served her sentence. The one good thing to come from the case is Sharon's work in getting the Jennifer Cave Act passed in 2007 by Governor Rick Perry. Specifically because of Laura's trials, the creation of the Jennifer Cave Act came about. It was something that was pushed by Sharon Cave and uh, the Cave family as a whole. 
It has two parts to it. Uh, the first part being specifically about the sentencing that Laura had, uh, and it changed it so that no longer, if, if there's a case like this that happened again, uh, we wouldn't have to use those grave digger laws to, to sentence someone for something like this again. And the second part was actually pertaining to the jury. Sharon Cave was really affected by a lot of the jury members' reactions to the exhibits that were shown at trial and the details that they were forced to hear. And so what it did was it offered counseling for jury members that take part in Texas trials, which is a huge deal because prior to this case, that was not something that was uh, mandatory for Texas to offer jury members. And overall, I, I think that it just really showcases that family's resilience and their ability to take the situation and actually give back to, to their community. Even in like a moment that was really heartbreaking and distressing to them, they found a way to make a difference. athlete and beloved track coach searches his yard for an intruder. I didn't see it, but there were shots. You heard what? There were shots. Police find him shot to death in his own yard. A burglar was in the backyard. You don't know what to think. You're just like, okay, what is going on? What's happening here? Just as important as who shot Dave Lout is why they shot him six times. Based on the way the news description was, I knew right away who I thought would have done it. Oxnard, California. Nestled on the Pacific Coast Highway between Los Angeles and Santa Barbara, this city of 200,000 is known for its strawberry fields, ocean living, and a harbor that serves at the closest point to Channel Islands National Park. The city of Oxnard is in Ventura County. It wasn't the most opulent neighborhood in the world, but it was a place where you could raise a family, be comfortable, know your neighbors. It's not a huge place, so you pretty much knew everybody there. My dad, he taught at Wainimi High School for, gosh, 30 plus years. And then my brother taught there also. That's pretty much Oxnard. <laughs> there are very nice parts of Oxnard where there is beautiful housing on the beach, near the beach, on like a river walk type area. And there's some really rough parts of Oxnard uh, with tenement housing, with people living very close together with a lot of crime. It's almost midnight on August 27, 2009. In a middle-class Oxnard neighborhood, Jane Loud hears a noise coming from outside the house. She asks her husband, Dave, to go outside and see what's going on. What happens next is recorded in a frantic 911 call from Jane. 911 emergency, this is Jane, what are you reporting? Somebody was, somebody was in our backyard. All right, what's the person look like that was in your backyard? I didn't see it, but there were shots. You heard what? There were shots. You heard shots being fired? Yes. My husband went outside. I want you guys to stay inside the house. Is everyone in your house? A counterboard in your house? My husband's still outside. Dave Lout is already outside and in the line of fire. Oh my gosh, everybody knew Dave. I always say, like, ever since I was a little kid, he's my Superman. He was very well liked by, got classmates and teachers and just counselors and people at church. You know, he was just very well-spoken, um, really considerate. 
Dave Lauk grows up in Oxnard, the son of a biology teacher who also coaches athletics. Dave was an athlete. He was driven by a very demanding father to be the highest he could be in track and field. We kind of come through a coaching kind of, you know, background. So, you know, the, the coaching goes with the sport thing. And Dave was a very, very good athlete. You know, he was going to go someplace or do something at university level. Jane and Dave Lau uh, knew each other from high school. I think they were homecoming queen and king at their high school. They were like high school sweethearts. They got along very, very well. They always seemed to just enjoy each other's company. As Dave rises through the ranks of competitive shot put, he and Jane become high school sweethearts. Jane came from a uh, pretty well-off farming family. The Lawbacher family is pretty prominent in Ventura County. They've been farming our county for years. They are one of the five, I would say, most well-known agricultural families in our area. They were ranchers. They had, they had a big ranch. You could go out to the ranch. And even I did when I was a kid. I learned how to shoot out there. You know, you could shoot like a 22 or, you know, whatever. Uh, you, you know, shoot bottles or whatever. After getting a scholarship at UCLA, Dave wins the NCAA shot put title and sets his sights on the Olympics. All the while, Jane is by his side. They marry in December 1980, and Dave sets his sights on the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles. And he won a bronze medal in those Olympics. It was a proud moment for me, because I was like, oh my gosh, this guy just won a bronze medal. Like, this is incredible. And he was actually a little bit disappointed because he wants to, like, win. He's a winner. I know he was frustrated with only winning the bronze. Uh, he thought he could have done better uh, then, but the city of Auckland was very proud of him. As a matter of fact, the city of Auckland posted a big parade for him when he returned. People came out to shake his hand and stuff like that. I remember hugging him and saying, I'm so proud of you, dude. You know, you did it. He goes, I didn't really do it. I got third. I'm like... You won a bronze medal in the Olympics. You are a winner. His career faded after the 84 Olympics because his body failed him. While training to be a firefighter, Dave seriously injures both knees. He fails to make the 1988 U.S. Olympic team. Suddenly, his career as an athlete is over. He just wasn't the same, you know what I mean? He did all the rehab, and he was getting older, too. So, you know, trying to rehab both knees at the same time. He kind of knew he was done. So after that, he's like, okay, you know what? Well, I'm just going to be a teacher. He was a biology teacher like my dad, teaching and coaching. Then he became the AD at Wainimi High School. And I've had a lot of kids come to me and tell me, you know, hey, I had your brother for a teacher. Or, hey, I had your brother for a coach. And, oh, man, he was the best. In 1999, Dave and Jane Lout adopt a baby boy from South Korea. Their 10-year-old son sleeps in his room as Jane makes a terrified call to 911. How many shots did you hear? I don't know. Like like one, two, a bunch? I don't know. A lot? Oh, my God. Jane, take a breath. Walk up to the... Walk up. Your husband is outside. Can you call to him? Tell him to come in? He's on the side. Okay, James, stay with me. I have officers there. There, I have two officers there. There, I want you to stay inside the house. Two officers arrive at the house. They're looking for an intruder in the backyard. They're young officers. You can imagine how scary that would be if you thought the potential gunman. It's pitch black back on that side yard. There's no lighting. Police discovered Dave's body on the ground with blood pooling around his face. They find Dave dead, lying by the barbecue. He's face down with his arm tucked underneath him. It's possible that Dave is still holding the gun. Police initially believe this might be a self-inflicted gunshot wound. But as more police arrive, they discover a gunshot wound in Dave's back. You can't shoot yourself in the back. Police now know that Dave Lout was shot more than once and that somebody else shot him. Jane was interviewed at the scene by a patrol officer, by a detective, then brought to Oxnard PD, interviewed for almost an hour and a half by another detective, the, at the time, the detective of the case. He went back to bed, and then he got up and said he thought he heard something. He said, there's something going on in the backyard. And then he says, put the dogs, get the dogs, get 
Yeah. If there was somebody in the backyard, would you let dogs out? Um, maybe. Jane tells police she hears a man's voice and then three shots. What the f? That's what Jane hears outside, and she calls 911 after the gunshots. She's in shock when police arrive. We were notified. I believe it was the next morning, pretty early, like five-ish, something like that. This is Detective Sanchez with Oxnard Police Department. Hi. I'm sorry to be calling you this early, and okay. and unfortunately, the reason I'm calling is there was an incident that occurred at David's house. Yes. And um, I'm sorry to say, but he's passed. Oh. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> At this point, it's still under investigation, but it appears that um, he was shot. So now you start processing in your head, like, how could this happen? And, you know, what's going on? We go out to the house, and then they had all of the, uh, what, the tape and everything all out. Cops were out and whatnot. And they proceeded to tell us what happened about the... Uh, a burglar. They didn't tell us too many details at the time. They seemed to be very, like, just kind of holding things back. When the officers arrived on the scene, they found the victim on the ground with multiple gunshot wounds, as well as pulling around his head. No casings or weapon were recovered on the scene initially. They also found bullet strikes or ricochets on both the wall and the ground surrounding the victim. And additionally, they found hair, blood, and tissue adhering to trash cans around near where the victim was located. Look, if Dave Lau found someone creeping around in his yard, would he have been shot multiple times in the head and then once in the back? Please know there's more to this story. Just as important as who shot Dave Lout is why they shot him six times. Jane said she closed the door and then heard a man's voice and then shots. That's where the gun came from. It came from my dad. It's going to take a skilled investigator to get at the truth. Two thousand nine, Oxnard, California, north of Los Angeles. Dave Lout, Olympic shot putter and beloved high school teacher, goes outside to investigate a noise. Police find him face down in a pool of blood, shot multiple times, including once in the back. Would a prowler lurking around the yard do that? A community is shocked by the murder of its Olympic hero. The students and staff at Dave's High School come to a memorial to share their shock and grief at his death. I've never seen a funeral like that, ever. Um, it was a gymnasium at the high school, and there were so many people there. There was people that I haven't seen in years that came to Dave's funeral. And, you know, of course, they were, you know, very remorseful and, and sad. And What was being said at that time was that he was, you know, killed by a prowler. One of the people that went up there to talk about it talked about how, you know, it's tragedy these days that, you know, you can't even go in your backyard to go throw the trash away, and then you have a prowler in your backyard who shoots and kills you. Jane and her family don't attend the memorials for Dave. She wasn't at the funeral, and nobody from her family was at the funeral. That was like, well, what's going on? Fearful that Dave's violent murder is by an unseen stranger who is still at large, the community holds a candlelight vigil. Once again, Jane Lout doesn't come out to the vigil, and the stress must be overwhelming for her. The police are wondering if it's more than grief that's keeping her away. As police interview Jane Lout, they notice changes in her story. I stood right up like on the edge of the grass, and he said, in the house. He's going towards the cave. Okay, no Earlier in the 911 call, Jane said she closed the door and then heard a man's voice 
and then shots. Here, did you shut the door and then hear the shots, or did you hear the shots and then shut the door? What were the dogs doing? What did they do when they heard the gunshots? Did you hear them barking at all? I don't remember them barking until the police came. Jane's description of the dog's reaction is an interesting detail. It's common knowledge that dogs have exceptional hearing. Depending on the particular dog and how familiar it is with sharp, loud noises, it will usually bark or maybe even howl. If the noise was loud enough and close enough, the dog might have even found a place to hide. Police look for clarification on the gunshots Jane heard. Well, you've been around guns, you've been around gunfire. What does it sound like? It sounds like a pop. Like, quick. How many pops did you hear? Three. Were they describing to me how fast they were? Pop, pop, pop. Okay. It wasn't pop, hesitation, pop, and hesitation, pop. It was one, two, three. I mean, not like Jane says she hears three rapid-fire shots, and that might suggest that a semi-automatic or an automatic weapon was used. So initially on the scene, no casings were located around the body, so that's typically indicative of either a revolver being used or someone picking up the casings. On the scene, they recovered bullets, and they were able to determine that they were 22 caliber class. The 22 caliber class of ammunition is easily the most common ammunition in the world. A lot of times with the smaller caliber bullets, because they're so small and light, they cause a lot of damage in the body because they ricochet around a lot. Do you have any guns in As part of their investigation, police use a gunshot residue kit to gather evidence. So when a firearm is discharged, these particles can tell you if a person recently fired a weapon, recently handled a weapon, or if they were in close contact to a weapon when it was discharged. Police are getting ready to test Jane for gunshot residue when she disappears. She's in the bathroom washing her hands, and before the detective can stop her, she wipes her hands on the towel. This is very unusual behavior. Gunshot residue is highly transient, so it's easily removed by rubbing the hands or washing them, which could skew the results of the test. But police do discover several rounds of unfired 22 caliber ammunition in the residence. The unfired bullets that were found at the scene ultimately will be of little use as far as evidence goes, but the gunshot residue that was found will ultimately prove to be much more useful. Then police make a startling discovery. When searching the house, there were numerous weapons recovered, including a 22 caliber revolver that was found hidden in a grandfather clock. That's not something you would expect to see every day. It's typical of a cowboy style gun that you may see in the movies. It was my dad's gun that he had given Dave. Yeah, I don't know if it was a Christmas present. That's where the gun came from. Good for my dad. And so that was the main suspect weapon that was compared. A prowler lurking around a yard isn't going to take Dave's gun and shoot him with it and then go into Dave's house and hide that gun in a grandfather clock. Do you know where all the guns are in your house? I think most of them are. I think they're all in that gun cabinet. And then he did have one, that handgun thing on the shelf, but I, I told him... When Michael arrived, he put it, he said he put it Dave Love's loving wife, Jane, the homecoming queen, becomes the prime suspect in his murder. Does she pull the trigger? You know how to shoot? Yeah. So it sounds like you have a gun safe. It sounds like you keep the, the guns locked it's up. It's supposed to be in there. I mean, you're not going to have something in your house, you're not going to use it. No. Especially like that, right? No. One thing is for sure, investigators have a long way to go to solve this murder. Oxnard, California. Olympic shot putter Dave Lout 
investigates a noise in his yard. How many shots did you hear? I don't know. Like like one, two, a bunch? I don't know. The story to the police was that they heard somebody outside and that they heard an intruder. Dave went outside. She heard gunshots. She called 911. Police find Dave's body, shot in the head and back. Jane does wash her hands and ultimately may have washed away any gunshot residue, making the test worthless. Uh, but on the night of the murder, they do find clothing that does come back with residue on it. So when a firearm is discharged, primer residues, vaporized lead, and burned and unburned gunpowder are expelled from the barrel of the firearm. These particles can tell you if a person recently fired a weapon, recently handled a weapon, or if they were in close contact to a weapon when it was discharged. Now, Dave's wife, Jane, has become the prime suspect. There was a point where they, they said we think that she did this and that's like you're going oh my gosh so that kind of hits you too like wow so now you start processing in your head like how could this happen and you know what's going on they find a gun hidden away in the grandfather clock if it is the murder weapon there's only one person that could have hidden it there and she's currently talking to police this is a very 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 serious situation here and we have other detectives out of your house right now. I sat here and I listened to your story and I gotta say it doesn't match up with what's out there. The sequence of events that you gave us compared with the evidence that's there don't really add up. Looking at it objectively, there are flags that come up that don't match and don't make sense. Despite Jane's obvious exasperation with the questioning, police continue to press her for more information. I don't know what else you want. Well, there are some things you're leaving out. I asked you about your relationship. I'm asking these questions for a reason. Is it abusive? Yeah. Physically? Yeah. Mentally? Well, I don't get what you're getting at. I don't know what you want. All I want to do is get the hell out of here and go home. You didn't get upset about anything until right now. You don't know me. I don't. And I told you that at the very beginning. You know nothing about me. You don't okay. know how I take things. You know nothing. Don't be afraid to show emotions. Don't be afraid I'm to... I'm not afraid to show my emotions, but I'm trying to be strong. Most of us can imagine what it would be like to be accused of something we didn't do. We'd feel shocked. We'd feel surprised. We really didn't do it. If you were continually accused, you might even start to get angry. The innocent person's biggest fear is not being believed. The guilty, however, have a different fear, the fear of being caught. Whether you're afraid of being disbelieved or you're afraid of being caught, the behavioral responses may be the same. They're both fear. It's going to take a skilled investigator to get at the truth. What I'm saying is that you sat there pretty stoic and calm until I told you that what you're telling me and what we have are not matching up. If you truly didn't do it, then I don't understand why you get so upset about now. If I was... In your shoes? I'll show you I didn't do it. You go find the guys that killed my husband. You never asked me that. You never asked me once. Investigators are finally able to get closer to the truth. You want to take a polygraph? Yeah, I don't care. I want to go home. No, I'm asking you. Do you want to take a polygraph test? Do I have to do it now? No. Do you want to take one? I'll do one. I want to see my son. I just want to leave. You don't just get to do what you want to do in a murder investigation. Our job right now is to find out who killed your husband, okay? To look at everything objectively. We need to find out who killed your husband. We have to be thorough, okay? And the best way, I think, for us to do that is you take a poly polygraph, he's here now, you're done, we move past you, we go to the next thing. The story kept jumping and changing. One kind of didn't pan out, and another one would come out, she'd say, okay, well, this happened, and then that happened, and... Then it was, well, it was an accident. While Jane now admits that she shot Dave, she says Dave threatens to shoot their son, so she wrestles the gun away from him. The ballistics investigation suggests that this is more than just an accidental discharge of a firearm. The victim had six gunshot wounds to the body. One of them was a graze wound to the left parietal scalp. The victim also had two gunshot wounds to the right side of the face, one to the right cheek near the eye, and one below towards the middle part of the cheek. Both of these um, projectile paths exited the left side of the victim's face. The victim also had a 
projectile wound to the right upper back. The victim's incapacitating wound entered the right parietal scalp and was recovered from the left front brain. He's twice as big as she is, and he's shot many times in the head and the back. This story still doesn't make any sense. With police becoming increasingly suspicious of her, Jane meets with her attorney. I said to her, Jane, you know, the only plausible explanation for what happened last night is that you shot him. I just need to know the why. It's not a who done it. I just need to know the why. And then she broke down and told me what happened. Jane says that Dave abuses her throughout their marriage. And as a battered spouse, she has to defend herself. Jane said Jane and Dave's relationship was one of him dominating her. The way he perceived his life is that sheer job was to take care of him in every way possible. That's how Dave viewed her, and that's how, unfortunately, Jane at that time viewed herself. But not everyone believes her claim of abuse. We never saw any inkling of abuse at all. We'd spend, like, you know, birthdays and Christmases and things like that. Nope, no problems. You'd never see anything. She would never say anything. The one thing Jane said she lived in a very volatile relationship where she was physically, mentally, and sexually abused repeatedly over 29 years. So there was no happiness in that marriage. It was a violent, volatile relationship. At this point, with the story still changing, police know they have to keep digging. Jane and her attorney offer police a new version of events. He comes out and he starts yelling at her, telling her that she does nothing for him, that she's worthless, and he has a gun. And he's waving the gun around. He pushes her around and he tells her that he's going to kill her and, and their son. When Jane tells the story to me initially, she's shaking, talking about it. She guides him outside to get him as far away from her son as possible. As they're backing up, Dave stumbles. Jane hits him like a linebacker, kicks him in the knee and tackles him down. And she gets the gun. And when she gets the gun, she decides that she's just going to keep shooting until he stops. They struggle. He grabs her by the arm and squeezes her arm. And she shoots him. It's another change in the story. And it's not the only possibility. Maybe she's not reacting to what Dave did in that moment, but she's rather executing a plan. Dave's family, including Don Lout's wife, Rebecca, suggests that there is no abuse. I also remember a very crucial uh, conversation that I had with her. Mm -hmm. And I remember early on I told you that I had asked her, like kind of hinted if Dave ever hit her. Yeah. And I remembered the conversation. And I asked her, do you think he would ever hit you? And she said, I don't think so. I mean, I can hear it in my head so clear now. But she said she didn't think so. If I truly felt like she she did this in self-defense, or if it was really that bad, I mean, I would... There's just no way. Not anything ever did I ever think that she was in fear for her life. Ever. And if she says that she was, she's lying. She is straight out lying. If self-defense isn't the motive, then what really happens? And why? It was just horrible. She pretty much went out to go take this trash out, and she pretty much just kind of like had a flashlight and just start bang, 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 bang. If Jane Lout had intent, then it's murder. If the jury believes that she was acting in self-defense, then she goes free. She goes back in the house. She's freaked out. She still thinks Dave's coming back. She doesn't think he's dead. She thinks he's coming back. So she hides the gun and she checks on her son. She comes back out and calls 911. Both sides agree that Jane shot Dave and that she called 911 and that she hid the gun. But they don't agree on why she did it. Can law enforcement use what they know about the gun itself to uncover the truth of what happens? This is a single action revolver, which means that the hammer of the weapon has to be cocked before the trigger can be pulled. So each time the hammer needs to be pulled back and then the trigger needs to be pulled to make a round discharge. How many pops did you hear? Three. Were they, describe them to me how fast they were. It wasn't pop, hesitation pop, and hesitation pop. It was one, two, three. Police know that this revolver requires time to cock back the hammer and pull the trigger. Every time a person firing this gun has to pull back that hammer and pull the trigger and then pull the hammer back and pull the trigger again, they have time to think about what they're doing. 
Jane had experience with the gun because Dave had taken her shooting with that gun multiple times. It was a gun that um, she was familiar with, and she knew how to fire it. One method for firing bullets rapidly with a revolver is a technique called fanning. Fanning is a technique that some shooters use to discharge a single action revolver and to discharge it quickly. It involves holding back the trigger of the firearm with one hand and using the palm of your other hand to strike the hammer repeatedly. Does Jane have enough experience to use this fanning technique to rapidly shoot Dave? The suspect claimed that she shot the victim in self-defense. However, due to the fact that the revolver was single action so that the hammer needed to be pulled and then the trigger for every shot, this does indicate pre-thought and continuing to shoot the gun until it was empty. Police don't find any DNA on the murder weapon, and they believe it's been wiped down for that very reason. February 2010, police called Jane Lout back to the station. Well, I've been working on this thing, Jane, for a long time. Since it happened. We put a lot of pieces together. As I know and you know, what you told us that night ain't the truth. You know? Police charged Jane Lout with first degree murder. A warrant's been issued for your arrest. Okay, for murder? You understand that? Like I told you, you're under arrest for murder. Okay, you have the right to remain silent. You understand that? A guilty verdict means a life sentence, and the use of a gun in the murder will double the sentence. Jane faces 50 years to life if she's found guilty. She took a lot of money from my mom. $1,500 for this or $2,000 for that. If they convict you, you're never getting out. You'll never hold your son again. You'll never hold your family again. The stakes for Jane could not be any higher. Along the Pacific Coast Highway in Oxnard, California, Jane Lout admits to shooting her high school sweetheart. Olympic shot putter Dave Lout, Jane fires all six shots in the single action revolver. Gunshot residue found on clothing, as well as the ballistics evidence gathered from each shot, give police some clues about where Jane is and how Dave is positioned. Jane Lout may have acted with intent or premeditation. The prosecutors don't know if there's an entirely different motive involved. And at this point, on the mind of a jury, they have to be concerned about reasonable doubt. Prosecutors offer Jane a plea deal. Plead guilty to a voluntary manslaughter charge. He offered us voluntary manslaughter 11 years, no gun. And I said, make it six years. And he said his office would not do six years. In California, a crime committed using a gun can mean an enhanced sentence of 10 to 25 years. I get a call from uh, the DA saying, who will agree to the six years if she pleads tomorrow? Okay, six years of voluntary manslaughter means three years actual time. It's half time. Okay, so it's a three-year sentence. This is the deal of the century. Okay, I literally celebrate. That night, Ron gives Jane the good news about the reduced charge. Jane tells me she doesn't want the deal. She wants to go to trial. She was resolute that she wanted to go to trial. Jane tells her lawyer she wants to go to trial and be found innocent of any crime on behalf of abused spouses everywhere. The stakes for Jane could not be any higher. If they convict you, you're never getting out. You'll never hold your son again. You'll never hold your family again. Jane refuses the plea deal, and her murder charge goes in front of a jury. Using forensic evidence, gunshot residue, and bullet trajectories, the prosecution tells the jury that Dave Lout is a sitting duck in the side yard. A damaged lead bullet was found underneath the victim's body, which had threads from both his t-shirt and sweatshirt embedded onto the projectile, as well as fragments from the concrete. The wound was in contact with the clothing and the ground when it exited the body, consistent with the victim being on the ground when he was struck with this projectile. This evidence doesn't look good for a self-defense case. If he's already laying on the ground when he shot a final time, 
He's the one who's defenseless. The victim had wounds to both the right and left side of his body, as well as some of the wounds being from front to back and some from back to front. Some of the wounds were close range, near contact to contact, where others were distant. So this indicates movement on the part of both the victim and the suspect. I, I guess one of them like skipped his ear and then another one kind of popped his shoulder. And then like, that's, that's only two. So all of a sudden he kind of went down and then he, she got him in the jaw. And now he's going down. So she's got three left and he's like on all fours and he's looking up and she just kind of boom, boom. The prosecution suggests that Jane may have a financial motive for killing Dave. Yeah, they had debt. Yeah, was Dave upside down financially? Of course he was. Was Jane ever going to be poor and homeless? No. Jane never wanted or could want for anything again. They had plenty of money. Her family was always going to take care of her. Police ask Jane's mother about the family's finances. You guys kind of kept in the dark about a lot of stuff? Oh, yeah. I never questioned her when she needed money. What did she tell you? Why did she need all this money? Pay bills. Police discover that Dave's mother is lending them money as well. You know, Jane had been uh, taking classes at Oxnard College mm -hmm. uh, so that she was preparing to be, I guess, a preschool teacher. So I'm not really sure. It never got explained to me, but she needed money for tuition. She took a lot of money from my mom. $1,500 for this or $2,000 for that or... And my mom was like, okay, you know what? Didn't ask a question. She just gave it to her. Like, okay, you know what? You need to go ahead. Then, a few months before the shooting, Jane asks Dave's mother for a big loan, $25,000. There were definitely money issues at play here, but is that enough to suggest that Jane shot Dave for financial gain? A prosecution witness testifies that Jane stands to collect almost $300,000 in insurance money from Dave's death. The defense presents its evidence to the jury that Jane is systematically beaten, abused, and raped over the 29-year relationship. Jane Lyle lived with a monster, and you're going to hear about it. You're going to hear in detail about what he did to her. You're going to hear in detail about how he treated her. You're going to be in detail about how he hurt her. He is not the hero of the Olympics. He is the monster who abused her for 27 years. If you understand domestic violence, you understand why, the why in this case, and the why was that Jane was a domestic violence victim was trying to save her son's life. Jane Lout takes the stand to testify in her own defense and set the record straight. Olympic medal winning shot putter Dave Lout is shot by his wife Jane, who is charged with first degree murder. She claims to have done it to end decades of abuse at Dave's hand. But the prosecution suggests that this is no heat of the moment act. The way Dave is shot gives Jane time to think about her actions according to the prosecution. They also believed that money was her motive. Our theory was basically long-term domestic violence, which resulted in PTSD, which resulted in uh, her believing that she had to defend herself at night when he pulled the gun. She was on a stand for three or four days. It was emotional. It was excruciating. On the witness stand, Jane says that for 29 years, her husband beats, rapes, and degrades her. Jane says that Dave is the one who takes the money, and she has to borrow $25,000 to repay the school. The defense shares all of this with the jury and pokes holes in the prosecution's case that this was about money. Now the defense gives their side of the moments leading up to Dave's shooting. Jane took her son and some other kids with some other moms to the beach in Oxnard. They had a beach day. And they got back late because the kids were having a good time. And Dave was home. He had been drinking. And he was, didn't have, he ran out of booze that day. He was mad at Jane for not being there to make him dinner. So around seven o'clock, she makes him a hamburger. Dave throws the hamburger at Jane, saying it's uh, not good enough, make him another one. He's raging in the house, he's yelling and screaming. 
I was calling her all kinds of names. So how did that gun get into Jane's hands? Was it in the gun safe? Was it already hidden in the grandfather car? Or did Dave have it and Jane wrestled it away? The defense says Jane can rapidly shoot the gun in her hand, questioning whether she shoots Dave in the heat of the moment or has time to consider her actions. The only dispute in the trial was the intent and self-defense and the mental issues of Jane Lau that she had. In the end, it's all about how Jane gets the gun. It's all about how she uses the gun. It's all about what she does with the gun after she uses it. That helps the jury determine whether there's intent or not. And while he was looking away from her, from a distance of several feet, she raised that revolver to the back of his head and she fired that first shot. They said it's one of the longest trials that they've ever had. It was like 11 weeks. It was a long time. It was tough. We had, it was 11 weeks of that stuff, man. It was That was brutal. It, like some days you went, came out of there and you felt like, okay, that was a great point. You felt good. Other days you just felt like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. The jury returns their verdict. Jane Lout is guilty of first degree murder. They did an outstanding job. They were able to like take and decipher all the stuff that was lies and put together what the truth was. All that mattered was that there were five bullets in that guy, two in the back of his head, and uh, the jury didn't accept self-defense. After refusing a plea deal and a six-year maximum sentence, Jane Lout is sentenced to 25 to life for the murder, as well as a gun enhancement of another 25 years. I go back that day, she turned down the offer. I was in this conference room where I'm talking to you, uh, sitting at this table to my left with her, and begging her to take it, her saying no. I failed her by not being able to convince her to take that deal. Sometimes you feel okay about it, you know, like the justice system did its job, and it, and it did all that it could do, but, you know, I, don't, I still don't have a brother, you know what I mean? And, that, and that's pretty much bottom line. I mean, I've had people that come up to me just, like, over the past few years and just say your brother was just such a good man you know not not just because of what he did it's just because of who he was i mean there's just so many there's so many things that i just i still wish he was here become a power couple, two of the beautiful people. How can something so right go so wrong? Jimmy Jost was shot 13 times by a Glock 9mm handgun. When love dies, sometimes it dies hard. She and the son were gone and people feared maybe it was a murder kidnapping. These people are in big trouble. And everything's bigger in Texas. The investigation involves state police, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the Secret Service. Austin, the capital city of the Lone Star State, Texas. Austin is perhaps the most liberal area of Texas, and it also happens to be the state capital. It's one of the most populous and fastest growing cities in the USA, and it's been growing since the Ice Age. Early inhabitants of the area identified in 9200 BC. Today, Austin has the nickname Silicon Hills because of its thriving tech and innovation industry. It's been voted one of the best cities to start a business. 
and one of the best places for female entrepreneurs. If you're looking for entertainment, you don't have to go past the Austin city limits to enjoy great music. A place of warmth and natural beauty. It's a green oasis and has the characteristics of the desert, the tropics, and a wetter climate all combined. Austin entrepreneur and socialite high flyer Rhonda Glover is missing. On Sunday, July 25th, 2004, her aunt drops by Rhonda's home to see if she can make contact with her niece. Rhonda Glover's aunt had come to Austin. She tried to get hold of Rhonda at the house. No answer. Went by there. Jimmy's car was there. There was still no answer. She finds the garage door and a utility door open. But what she smells emanating from the house has her scrambling to call 911. The smell is unlike anything she's ever smelled before. It's the smell of death. Austin Police Department are deployed to a home on Mission Oaks Boulevard in southwest Austin. This is a very upscale neighborhood. The house was like any other pleasant upscale home in any contemporary American suburb. It wasn't overly ostentatious. It was like a normal suburban house of a middle-income family. Police are warned that the unlocked doors are very out of character for these homeowners. The aunt fears something is dreadfully wrong within this idyllic home. Officers enter the home and they're immediately assaulted by a foul odor. There are also large insects crawling all over the home and this indicates to them that there's likely a dead body. For homicide detectives, they know the smell of death. When those first two cops responded, they knew someone was dead in that home. As the two Austin police officers move up the stairs, the offensive odor increases in intensity. On the second floor, officers find the decomposing body of a male victim lying in the hallway near the doorway of his upstairs bedroom. The victim is male and he's been shot to death. Then police give the aunt the news. Death notifications are difficult under any circumstance and are extremely traumatic for family. In this case, police need to get very pressing information from the aunt. Given the state of the home, it's not an appropriate place for the conversation. So they do the best they can with the circumstances. The aunt tells police who resides in the mansion. A well-known Texan lives there with his partner, her niece, the famous beauty queen Rhonda Glover. It's one of many of their upscale homes. The aunt feels certain that the victim is oil man James Jost. James Jimmy Jost is born in Dallas, Texas. Jimmy grows up in the Memorial area of Houston and graduates from Memorial High School. Then he attends the University of Texas in Austin. Jimmy was an oil millionaire entrepreneur. The Jost family oil money goes back three generations. Jimmy's inspiration comes from his grandfather, who is known as a wildcatter a term for an oil man who drills exploratory wells in territory that's not already known to be an oil field. Jimmy inherits the family wildcatter spirit. He's always searching for the next big oil strike or the latest oil drilling technique. In the 1980s, he employs horizontal drilling as it is becoming the very latest technique to reach hard-to-tap oil reserves. The move pays off. Jimmy is a man who inherits millions from his family and then goes on to build his own fortune from pioneering oil and gas drilling technology. Handsome and charming, innovative and hardworking, Jimmy Jost is a titan in the Texas oil and gas industry. Jimmy Jost had a roller coaster career as a multi millionaire oil magnate uh, and entrepreneur. He rode the market like a plastic pony in front of the grocery store. When it was up, he was up. When it was down, he was down. But he always came back. He is also a socialite, known for fabulous dinner parties that Jimmy prepares. Friends describe Jimmy Joe's as a great guy, a good, loyal friend. He is a warm host and loves to make people laugh. He has countless friends in Houston, many of them oil men. He was calm, he was confident. He was polite, courteous, and he had a calming influence on other people. He was nonviolent, and very charming women loved him. 
there always seems to be beautiful women in his circles. And they're frequenting the most upscale restaurants and bars. Jimmy always seems to be in the center of the fun. Jimmy likes to spread his wealth around. There are legendary stories about him giving generous tips to waiters and picking up huge taps. Even though he's wealthy, Jimmy isn't a snob. He's interested in people from all walks of life. He was known to invite the valet or the waiter to his parties. His longtime partner is a former Miss Houston beauty queen, Rhonda Glover, who runs her own recruiting business. Jimmy and Rhonda have a nine-year-old son together. Detectives search the mansion for clues. Shell casings from six bullets are found near the body, and an additional four shell casings are recovered in the bedroom. At first glance, Jost is found on his back, near the doorway to the bedroom, and there's blood spatter. A search warrant is obtained and police don't waste any time. Crime scene specialists are deployed. There is blood in the hallway, as well as the bedroom, and an increased blood concentration soaked into the carpet where Jost goes to the ground. It looks like he tries to flee and isn't able to make it. All of these blood spots found on the surfaces will be subject to an analysis by a blood spatter expert. As many friends as Jost has, it's conceivable he also has enemies. He's incredibly wealthy, and maybe this is an oil deal gone bad. Police search the property for evidence of a possible robbery, but there are no signs of forced entry, and nothing seems to be missing from the home. Jimmy has a very beautiful partner, and he's used to Rhonda turning heads. That right there could make some people envious. When the body of Jimmy Jost is found, Rhonda Glover and her son are missing. The fear is that they've been kidnapped. Perhaps they're going to be held for ransom. With Jimmy brutally slain and his wife and young child missing, what could have happened to Jimmy Jost and his family? Could they have been abducted by his killer? The quest now is find Rhonda and find her son. Rhonda did not give up her interactions with other gentlemen aside from Jimmy. And Jimmy was rather possessive. The sheer number of bullets could indicate rage by the shooter or maybe an excessive fear of Jimmy Joss. According to Rhonda, there are two sides to Jimmy. You know, there's a group of death worshippers, and I'm just a lonely girl, and people think I'm crazy. Mega-rich Texas oil heir, Jimmy Jost, is found murdered in the mansion he shares with his partner, former beauty queen, Rhonda Glover. Jimmy Jost was shot by a Glock 9mm handgun, six shots below the waistband of his shorts. His body is badly decomposing, and police gather evidence to try to understand what happened at the crime scene. But... When police discover Rhonda Glover has been missing since March, they fear she too may be a victim of Jimmy Jost's killer. She and the son were gone and people were feared perhaps this was a kidnapping case. Maybe it was a murder kidnapping. And so they were searching for Rhonda. But actually, there's trouble in paradise. Rhonda's aunt tells police that neither parent is supposed to have custody of the boy. The aunt comes looking for Rhonda because no one's heard or seen from her for several months. But she knows Rhonda and Jimmy have an on-again, off-again relationship, so what she thinks is that perhaps the couple is reconciled and Rhonda just forgot to let her know. Police canvass the area, and no one has seen anyone other than a friendly white male, presumably Jimmy Jost, coming in and out. One neighbor recalls seeing Jost's garage door open on Thursday. Another recalls seeing the garage door open on either Monday or Tuesday. The garage door being unlocked is so unusual, a neighbor walks over and knocks on the door to check on Jimmy. But no one answers, so she leaves. The neighbor confirms that Jost did have various house sitters from time to time. But how well did he know these house sitters? Police need to track down exactly who's been at the mansion lately. Police survey the area to see if there are any surveillance cameras in the vicinity. This is a gated community. Perhaps there's a list of who's come and gone. Officers determine that access codes to this gated community aren't personalized, 
and there's no way of tracking who comes in or out of the area. It gets worse. There are also no cameras to monitor who's coming and going. The Travis County Appraisal District information reveals the home on Mission Oaks is owned by Rhonda Glover, and utility records also show an active account in Glover's name for that same residence. So the home does not belong to the victim. It's actually one of the many gifts he's given Rhonda. Rhonda Glover is a small town Texas girl who gets her start by winning big prizes in rodeo beauty competitions. Rhonda Glover was an attractive, vivacious beauty queen and rodeo queen. She was quite active in the rodeo circuit. I mean, she wasn't a bull rider, but you know, you could be a rodeo beauty and a beauty queen. And that famous beauty catapults her out of her small town world and into the stratosphere of upscale Texan glamour. She had a great personality and she was a charming person to be around. She competes in bigger and bigger beauty pageants across the state. And she's a contestant for Miss Houston. She doesn't win the crown, but she does meet a lot of rich Texan men who are intrigued by her beauty and charm. In 1989, a Texan real estate mogul takes Rhonda to a party. But it's a terrible date. She keeps staring at a man at a party who's got a lot of charm and charisma. Her date comments that it's rude to stare at other men when they're together, but Rhonda admits that she just can't keep her eyes off the man across the room. And that man turns out to be Jimmy Jost. The next day, the real estate agent happens to run into Jimmy, whom he'd never met before. He tells Jimmy how awful his date the night before was. This is how the two men begin what becomes their greatest friendship. And it's also how the door gets opened for Rhonda to meet Jimmy. Not long afterwards, Rhonda Glover and Jimmy Jost are introduced. There's an immediate attraction between the two, and they begin dating. Rhonda is renowned for her sexual prowess, and Jimmy is completely smitten by her. It doesn't take long for them to get serious and move in together. He was a perfect match for beauty queen Rhonda Glover. If you ever met Rhonda, you'd know immediately she was energetic, enthusiastic, outgoing, and a real charmer. And great fun. She and Jimmy hit it off immediately. They become a power couple, and both make a lot of money. They move in high society and attend glamorous events with the Texas oil crowd. They don't marry, but on October 24th, 1994, the couple have a child together. The baby doesn't slow down their high-flying lives. Jimmy and Rhonda continue to live it up. Jimmy buys Rhonda her own house in Austin, several cars, and though he usually gives her tens of thousands a month to cover her cost, he once famously writes her a check for $1 million to use for spending money. Although he's a wildcatter, a daring entrepreneur, and a fun-loving, life-of-the-party type. He's passive when it comes to Rhonda. She's the one in charge. But years pass since the two fall in love, and now they are known to drink and to get into big arguments. In fact, the police have been deployed to the mansion on Mission Oaks Boulevard on more than a dozen occasions because of domestic troubles. Rhonda did not give up her interactions with other gentlemen aside from Jimmy. And Jimmy was rather possessive. He was never violent with her, quite the opposite. But he always forgave her. Uh, he said she could basically do whatever she wanted. He just was crazy about her anyway. By the end of 2003, the money's dwindling. And their regular fighting and occasional drug use leads Rhonda's mother to fight for and win custody of their child. Jimmy Jost's brother calls police with information he thinks they need to know. He tells authorities that the owner of a popular shooting range has told him that Rhonda Glover is recently there, taking shooting lessons and practicing at the shooting range. Police also discover that Rhonda rents a recreational vehicle on July 21st, just days before the murder. Police issue a nationwide alert for Rhonda Glover. The former beauty queen, once thought to be a possible victim, is now a person of interest in the murder of her partner, oil tycoon Jimmy Jones.
Police learn that murdered oil tycoon Jimmy Jost's longtime relationship to Rhonda Glover is on the rocks. The victim's brother tells police that Rhonda Glover recently buys a handgun and is learning how to shoot. When police can't locate Glover, they put out a nationwide alert to find the former beauty queen. The autopsy reveals that Jimmy Joe's dies of multiple gunshot wounds. A total of 13 gunshot wounds to Joe's chest, abdomen, arm, and groin areas with three exit wounds indicate he is shot 10 times. The angle of at least one of the bullet wounds indicates that the victim was shot while lying on the ground. The sheer number of bullets could indicate a rage by the shooter or maybe an excessive fear of Jimmy Joss. The shell casings are determined to have been fired from a 9mm semi-automatic handgun. At least one bullet goes through him and into the wall while he's moving down the hallway, which causes the high-velocity impact stains found on the walls. Police put a trace on Rhonda's cell phone. They feel pretty confident that Rhonda is going to use that cell phone eventually. On Tuesday, July 27th, Kansas Highway Patrol officers tracked signals from Glover's cell phone to an RV parked outside a truck stop in Hayes. Rhonda Glover is located wearing a yellow sundress in a store buying milk. That is when the ATF became involved. It turned out Rhonda Glover was not honest in filling out her ATF form when she purchased the gun. She is taken into custody and charged with falsifying her address on a firearm application, which is a federal crime. At first, police don't reveal that the body of Jimmy Chost has been found. Okay, you're in custody for a federal violation. Good idea. It involves firearms and it was handled in the ATF. I just don't know what's going on. Okay, I understand. I was on vacation with my son. So, I'm just. Where did you go? We went to, I was going to go on audition for a, um, a Nashville show. I'm a singer. And so I had my guitar and my. And I chickened out going up there. And then I went to Austin because I have a home that I sold to my ex. And um, he gave me $100,000 equity on it. And he wanted to keep the house. And he was worshiping the devil and told my mother that, um, the, um, that Lucifer was going to come into my son and become the Holy Spirit. So when all this devil worshiping stuff started coming out, I got away from him and I wanted nothing to do with him. He scares the crap out of me. Rhonda tells police the last time she saw Jimmy was three months ago. I read the thing about a homicide and I didn't, it said it took place at Admission Oak's house. I thought maybe Jimmy killed somebody there. Did he kill somebody? Did you find a body there? Because that's what I'm thinking. Well, yeah, we did find a body. Police interview Rhonda for about an hour while she talks about how bad a person Jimmy is. Try to convince me that he was going to become God. You know, because in Revelation it says that God is going to come, he has chosen a man, and he's going to come and walk with us and be our God. Okay? So Jimmy had me convinced that it was going to be him. She became convinced that Jimmy was the devil and that God had sent her on a mission. I met a guy um, who told me that I need to probably get a gun. And so I went and took a handgun safety course with my son. She bought the gun on June 24th, 2004. Then she promptly went to take shooting lessons at the shooting range not far from where she lived. I've got to tell you, you know, you need to protect yourself. You need, you need to protect yourself. Yeah. And so I uh, went to Reds and uh, practiced with a 19, a Glock 19. A Glock 19, yeah. And um, he said, that's the best gun for you. He said, everybody buys the 9 millimeters, or they fit in your hand easy. Well, Detectives continue to press Rhonda about her actions on July 21st. She finally breaks down and confesses. Oh, I did do it. <laughs> I did. He came after me. I did do it. <laughs> okay. I wanted to get my camping equipment from the house. <laughs> I went to the house. <laughs> I took my gun with me. 
and Owen was upstairs in the attic eating all my camping stuff, and he, I heard the garage door open. <laughs> he came at me, and we struggled, and I got to through my brief face, and I got the gun, and he, he hit me. He wanted to hit me on the head with it. <laughs> with the gun. Uh-huh. He didn't get it. I had it in my hand. He, he hit me like this. Okay, and I had my hand off the trigger. I was holding on to it. Because I took a defensive class with this guy, Rico. Okay. I kicked him off at me. And he got up and he was coming. Through. I was in the bedroom and he was coming at me. <laughs> and he was screaming, you I'll kill you in this demonic voice. Just like Satan would. <laughs> and I just emptied I just emptied the gun and I ran. I ran, I ran. She originally claimed he was strangling her as she had to defend herself. But he wasn't shot at that close range of him strangling her. No, no, no. I shot him from the bedroom. I did not move an inch. I was scared to death. Rhonda Glover is charged with first-degree murder. Her bail is set at $1 million. A search of Rhonda's rented RV reveals a 9mm handgun. Firearms examiners test fire the handgun and determine that it is the weapon used to kill Jimmy Jost. Police also find a business card for a second shooting range. Police ask the shooting range to tell them a little bit about their dealings with Rhonda. In May 2004, he first instructs Rhonda Glover in the use of firearms. She kept telling me about an ex that she had and uh, that they were having a rocky relationship and uh, she was afraid and wanted to learn how to shoot to defend herself. She rents a handgun and he teaches her the double tap, the technique of gently and quickly pulling a trigger twice in rapid succession. Rhonda purchases her own 9mm handgun. On July 10th, Rhonda Glover returns, purchases ammunition, and proceeds straight to the practice range and requests advanced firearms training. Rhonda wants to learn and talk about scenarios that go beyond your basic self-defense situations. Then she scheduled a defensive lesson. A uh, defensive lesson is when we allow the student to holster and carry additional magazines and we teach him how to draw from concealment, how to uh, use a weapon while moving. She asks to learn how to make sure there are no intruders in the home. She fears that people may be in her house when she's not around. She draws a floor plan and learns how to flush out intruders. Instead of doing my regular defensive lesson, she wanted to simulate her house. And she did mention the exact scenario of him coming up the stairs, her being in the bedroom. She wants to do something to an upstairs bedroom. And she says, in this upstairs bedroom, there's an attic door. She wanted to practice shooting to the left side of the bed and then shooting the attic door, which would be in the right corner of the room as you entered the bedroom. And that's the scenario she wanted to practice. She asked, how should she shoot someone who's sitting on the sofa? Her instructor has a problem with that. It doesn't sound defensive to him. It's like, well, why would, you know, if somebody just breaking into your house, why would somebody be sitting on your couch? But when she wants to know how to go around the front of the couch and shoot him again to make sure he's dead, that's when the instructor says, that's when you call 911. So right there, I'm thinking, well, she sounds to me like she's talking about somebody specifically. I mean, for you to want to go around and shoot somebody a second time, to me, you must have some kind of anger towards somebody. And I was like, hey, I, you know, this lady's really starting to creep me out. Rhonda Glover practices and catches on fast. She comes to the range on the day of the murder and practices shooting her gun. When she came in uh, on the 21st, um, how was her demeanor? She come in and then she went to the restroom and changed. And how was she dressed then? Just... That's kind of strange because like she came out and she was wearing like some biker stuff. Like she had a uh, chaps, leather chaps. She is told by her instructor she's made tremendous improvement. She showed a lot of improvement from the first time she came in to the second time that I shot with her. Because mm-hmm. I want to say that she got all her her shots in the 
you know, in the torso area of that target. Rhonda says Jimmy has fooled everyone into believing he's a nice guy. But Rhonda knows the truth. In May 2004, Rhonda tells a friend that Joss is involved in child pornography and that he has sexually abused her son. She kept calling him Satan and she needed to get rid of Satan. Why was she calling him Satan? Because she felt that he was Satan. She felt he was involved in child pornography. But Joss's best friend tells detectives that Jimmy worships Rhonda, provides for her like a wife, and supplies her with lavish homes, cars, cash, and kindness. According to Rhonda, there are two sides to Jimmy. One is the gregarious friend, the life of the party that most people know, and then there's the darker side, the one that only she knows. I'm held on to this information, so I'm scared of him. You know, there's a group of devil worshippers, and I'm just a lonely girl, and people think I'm crazy. When Jimmy Jost is murdered and his partner, Rhonda Glover, goes missing, police put out a nationwide alert to find her. Her cell phone is traced, and Rhonda is caught and charged with first-degree murder. But Rhonda tells police that her partner is an abuser and that she kills him to protect her and their child. Rhonda tells officers that she only kills Jimmy Jost to save her own life. He has hurt me before, and I'm very scared of him, and this is not premeditated. This is just to protect me. But it's not the first time she's made serious complaints. In fact, Rhonda calls 911 on a regular basis. In the year before Jost's death, Rhonda Glover frequently calls 911 in fear and panic. Police investigate over and over and find nothing. She would call the police at least three to four times a week saying Jimmy had killed someone and buried them in the backyard or there were bodies in the walls. Police have labeled her an EDP or emotionally disturbed person. This designation alerts law enforcement that the individual is genuinely experiencing distress to approach with caution and that perhaps the best results can be achieved by applying de-escalation techniques. Police reports, rehab records, and personal accounts all describe the erratic actions and body language of former beauty queen Rhonda Glover. She alleges that Jimmy is a devil worshiper who partners to build and operate an underground tunnel stretching throughout the city in which mass child sex torture and murder occurs. Officers responding to 911 calls are very familiar with Rhonda Glover's regular calls. On one 911 call, officers arrive to Rhonda Glover, still talking to 911, reporting on the demons in the walls of her home. Paranoid delusions were part and parcel of Rhonda's regular daily routine. The police were so used to her calling almost every day with another paranoid delusion that it's like, here we go again, and they send out the community officer not to arrest anybody but to counsel her to calm her down because they were very familiar with her. But there appears to be one stable influence in Rhonda's life, her partner, James Jimmy Jost. Officers asked Joss if Rhonda Glover is a danger to him, herself, or anyone else. And Joss assures authorities definitively saying he is not in danger from Rhonda. When he would always tell the police, she's not a danger to me, she's not a danger to herself, I can handle her. And he could, for many years. Jimmy Jost remains steadfastly devoted to Rhonda Glover, even though her presence causes distance from many of his friends. Rhonda Glover told authorities she was bipolar. However, according to her medical records, which she allowed me to obtain, it said that she had psychosis NOS, which means not otherwise specified. She's a very bright woman, but the mental health issues obscure that and gets her out of focus, shall we say. But does her condition make her totally unreliable? Is there truth to her claims about Jimmy's violence toward her? 
Jost recently offers Rhonda a $350,000 engagement ring that she refuses. Perhaps money isn't her only concern. Is it possible that his devotion to her borders on obsession and that he is dangerous? A packed memorial service is held for Jimmy Jost at St. Martin's Episcopal Church. He's celebrated by many friends who miss Jimmy's gregarious, generous spirit. No one there can believe that Jimmy is a dangerous man. But Rhonda gets her day in court. In early 2006, Rhonda Glover faces a Travis County, Texas jury of nine women and three men. She tells the story of the day she shoots her partner and the father of their child. It's a story that shocks those who love and know Jimmy Jost. During her trial, Rhonda Glover tells the court that on the day of the murder of Texas oil tycoon Jimmy Jost, she hoped she wouldn't run into Jimmy. She has been deliberately avoiding Jost for months because he drinks too much and beats her. She testifies that she goes to the Southwest Austin house with the purpose of dropping off her handgun and picking up some camping gear needed for a trip to Nashville she has planned with their child. She tucks her 9mm semi-automatic handgun into the back of her pants. She says the gun purchase is preventative. Her thinking is that if he knows she has a gun, he'll stop stalking her. On the day of the killing, she had it on her in case she was ambushed by her former lover. Rhonda says that at the time, she didn't believe Jimmy was in the home, but he walks in surprising her. They begin to argue and he grabs her throat, choking her. She fears for her life. She says she had occasion, unfortunately, to pull out the hidden gun and start firing. She says the firing just perpetuated. Rhonda is tearful as she says, I shot him. I shot him because I thought he was going to kill me. She tells the jury that Jost is dangerously obsessed with her. He has an outgoing public persona, but a dark private one. Rhonda's defense says she is a victim of abuse and has finally fought back. Will the jury find her version of the events plausible? Steve originally claimed he was strangling her and she had to defend herself. But he wasn't shot at that close range of him strangling her. No, it was that far away. Far enough away for him to be taken by surprise and taken down by 13 bullets. The prosecution isn't buying it. They have strong words for Rhonda Glover. They call her testimony a prefabricated story and tell the jury she's crying crocodile tears. They even bring up her drug and alcohol use. Prosecution calls several of Jimmy Jost's friends to answer Glover's testimony that Jost beats her. They all testify that Jimmy was gentle with an aggressive woman and accuse Rhonda of lying. Numerous stories come out discussing Rhonda's violence and delusions. There's a gripping story of how Rhonda attacks Jimmy at a barbecue and knocks him down, punches him, and has to be dragged off him. But Rhonda Glover does not appear to be so off balance that she is incapable of calculating her personal gain with Jimmy Jost. Circumstances have changed. Jimmy's great fortune that he seems to have gladly handed over to her over the past 15 years in the form of cash and jewelry and property and other gifts, uh, it's considerably shrunk. The prosecution says that with Jimmy's fortune dwindling, Rhonda wanted to get her hands on the payout from Jimmy's large life insurance policy. Prosecutors say Rhonda Glover carefully plans the murder. She makes the purchase of her very own semi-automatic handgun. She takes not only basic shooting lessons in the months before the murder, but specialized ones, dealing with very particular scenarios. Rhonda had been rehearsing this homicide repeatedly at the local gunshot range. She even specifically asked, if I'm at the top of the stairs or if I'm upstairs and an intruder is coming up the stairs and I'm there, when can I shoot him? Her shooting instructor testified that Rhonda was very proud of the fact that her targets were generally hit center mass. 
And that means that she was proficient at striking the target in an area that represented the heart, the lungs, the spine, the vena cava. On July 21, 2004, she rents a car, drives it to a shooting range in Oak Hill to practice, then drives to the house on Mission Oaks Boulevard. Prosecution alleges she lures him into the bedroom. She ambushes him and shoots Jimmy Jost in cold blood. She drives with her son back to a friend's home, and by the friend's account, Rhonda was calm. A friend testifies that just two months before the murder, Rhonda says she plans on seducing Jimmy, handcuffing him to the bed, mutilating him, and then setting the house on fire. Defense counsel wants the friend to testify as to why Rhonda Glover wants to kill Jimmy Jost. To specifically discuss Rhonda's allegations about child pornography and the abuse of their child. But the court doesn't allow any discussions of the sex abuse allegations. They believe it's prejudicial, but that doesn't stop Rhonda. Rhonda Glover disregards this order and says, I thought during this trial and testimony that I would be able to prove that Jimmy had in fact molested my son. Despite what she's been ordered, she gets herself heard, but the jury's not buying it. They're not convinced. The many graphic accounts of Rhonda's violence and acts of premeditation add up. There's a history of delusional behavior, excessive drug and alcohol use, and violence, at least according to what's heard at the trial. It's on record that not long before the murder, Child Protective Services needs to check on their child, and Rhonda tells the worker that their child is Jesus Christ. Her claims of self-defense are really weak. In fact, it takes the jury only two hours of deliberations to find her guilty of murder. She's sentenced to 46 years in prison, and she's set to be released in 2050. I wouldn't say it was an open and shut case, but the fact that she did not want to claim psychiatric reasons. She did not want to use an insanity defense. She was very sensitive about the fact that the people knowing she had mental problems. And so that never came up. Maybe she would have been sent to a mental hospital. No way of knowing. His best friend remembers that he and Jimmy share a beer on July 20th, just before his murder. Jimmy steers the conversation away from himself and Rhonda. Maybe he's taken all he can take from her and is finally ready to let her go. Maybe she senses it too and feels the need to kill him before he cuts off ties with her. We'll never know. The Austin police revealed to his best friend that the last call Jimmy Jost makes on his cell phone is to him, but he misses it. And his friend muses that Jimmy's only fault is loving women too much and being too generous. Something powerful draws this couple together and keeps them together for far too long. Friends say the wrong woman gets a hold of Jimmy Jost. It's a sad story of what seems to be mental illness, drugs, and a life excess. Glover petitions the Court of Appeals of Texas and asserts that the district court abuses its discretion by refusing to submit an instruction on the lesser included offense of criminally negligent homicide. On November 8, 2007, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals denies the appeal and upholds the judgment. Rhonda Glover was both a lover and a killer. She was both the beauty and the beast. Jimmy Jost was the last to know this. And the friends of Jimmy were especially heartbroken because he was such a nice guy. And despite Rhonda's problems, he felt safe with her or felt he could be safe with her.
self-made millionaire with a wonderful family, a very exclusive neighborhood, a lawsuit with millions of dollars at stake. And I immediately learned that Bill McLaughlin had been in this very contentious lawsuit with his former business partner. A shocking and bloody event that no one sees coming leaves authorities baffled and friends and family terrified. So the suspect had keys to the place, entered, shot him immediately, and exited immediately. So it was an execution. Newport Beach is in Orange County, California, and is one of the wealthiest cities in the nation. Newport Beach is a coastal city. It has a lot of really nice homes overlooking the beach. Newport Beach is very affluent, but it's this really weird, kind of cool, eclectic mixture of wealthy people and broke surfers. It's high end. A lot of prominent people live there. A lot of people with money live there. And Bill McLaughlin, he was one of those people. He was a multimillionaire and was living right on the bay in the Newport area. He has the kind of life that most people dream of, but even the most beautiful dream can turn into a nightmare. On December 15, 1994, at 9.11 p.m., a call is placed to 911. Newport Beach Emergency, please fire a paramedic. Oh, no! Oh, no! What's the problem there? Oh, no! Oh, no! What can you do, please, for sir? The call is coming from Bill McLaughlin's home, and the caller is his son, Kevin. There's this heart-wrenching 911 call where he's trying to describe to the 911 operator that his father has been shot. He had some uh, physical difficulties from an accident that he was involved in. He didn't speak well. Your dad? Okay, we have an officer on the way to your house right now. Kevin McLaughlin was skateboarding home one night, and he got hit by a drunk driver. The accident resulted in substantial brain damage to Kevin, so he goes from being this super athletic surfer kid to having a major disability because of this accident. Is there anybody out there that can talk to me? You're the only one that can talk to me? Okay, is it your, is your father or your dog? Emergency personnel arrive and find Bill McLaughlin lying in a pool of blood on the kitchen floor. He is dead. Police walked in and, uh, and immediately went to work. So Bill McLaughlin is on his back in the kitchen. He's got six gunshot wounds. He's been shot multiple times in his own home in one of the safest neighborhoods in the country. Who would have done that? And more importantly, why? 54-year-old William Bill McLaughlin is born in Southern California in 1939. He studies biological engineering in college. After he graduates, he gets a job selling medical supply equipment. In 1975, Bill invents a new kind of dialysis catheter. Bill McLaughlin was essentially an executive that got together with, with a partner of his in the pharmaceutical business, and they invented a way to separate plasma from blood. And this man um, and Bill essentially partnered up and sold this technology to a major pharmaceutical company. It's a groundbreaking invention and one that's still in use today. When he sells it, it makes him a multimillionaire. Bill, his wife, and his three kids move into a house in Newport Beach. It's in a gated community called Balboa Coves. You know you're doing well when you can afford a house there until his wife files for divorce in 1990. Bill McLaughlin had been married for over 30 years. He had uh, two daughters and a son. And you know, it was one of those things where the marriage just kind of sputtered out. There was no great drama. It's never easy going through a divorce, especially when you have kids involved. But all that said, Bill seems to come through it OK. He maintains a good relationship with his kids. And he certainly keeps busy. He regularly flies his private plane to Las Vegas, where he has a vacation home.
On Thursday, December 15, 1994, Bill flies home from Las Vegas, as he's done many times before. Bill McLaughlin was home with his son. His son was not supposed to be home. He was supposed to be in a meeting, but he was not. He did not go to the meeting. So he was there, and they probably had something to eat. The son went upstairs to listen to some music, and Bill was downstairs uh, at his table in the kitchen, or near the kitchen. Bill is going over some legal documents. Documents uh, related to a lawsuit that he'd been involved in with his former business partner. And that's when all of a sudden somebody came through the front door, which originally was locked, and uh, came through and shot him six times while he was in his kitchen. Kevin was upstairs listening to music, and he heard a series of gunshots downstairs. And he, he came downstairs, and he saw his father dying on the kitchen floor. And he immediately dialed 911 and tried his best to communicate with his voice problems that he had to the 911 operator of the police department and tell them his dad was shot. Mr. McLaughlin was in the kitchen on his back. He had bullet holes in him, six of them. Uh, there were bullet casings from a semi-automatic handgun would eject the uh, casing, and they were six of those around on the floor, and he was dead. The rounds were determined to be a, a type of ammunition called federal hydroshock, which is um, it's a vicious it's a vicious round. Essentially, it expands inside the human body. The only other person in the house at the time of the murder is Kevin. It's clear he's not a serious suspect, but police still have to clear him, and they do pretty quickly. When the police got there and looked at the scene, it really did look like it was a planned murder because the person came in, the person had keys to get in the front door, had two keys, one for the bolt lock and one for the regular lock, and one was still in the, the keyhole and the other one was down on the floor. The one that was stuck in the front door was a freshly cut Ace Hardware key, and the one on the mat was an original community access gate key. So the suspect had keys to the place, entered, shot him immediately, and exited immediately. So it was uh, an execution. No forced entry, no sign of a struggle, and nothing was taken from the home. This rules out a robbery gone wrong, but who would want Bill McLaughlin dead? Investigators discover that Bill's former business partner believes that Bill owes him millions of dollars, and the two have been battling in court. It appears that Bill is going over documents about this lawsuit when he's attacked in his kitchen. That's a motive. Uh, whether or not that person had anything to do with the murder or something the detectives needed to, needed to find out right away. Uh, that was of interest to them. They certainly took a look at the partner. Bill had just essentially won the lawsuit. The court came out with an indicated ruling that was going to free up about $12 million to Bill McLaughlin. The ex-partner has a solid alibi, so is ruled out fairly quickly. Bill was divorced at the time of this incident. An ex-wife might be a logical suspect if the divorce is still in progress, but Bill and Susan have been divorced for years. Divorce can bring out the worst in people, especially when custody of children is an issue, but their youngest child is 26. It doesn't seem like his ex-wife would have much to gain. Investigators are still working at the scene when a woman named Nanette Johnston shows up. There was a point in the investigation, about probably an hour and a half into it maybe, when Nanette arrived home. She lived at that house, and she had been shopping uh, in the, uh, one of the nearby malls and arrived home to see all the police tape and all the police cars, and they interviewed her outside the house. They don't know who she is. She has to explain to the police that she's Bill's fiance and that she lives in the house with him. She's already figured out that there's something wrong, but she's shocked to discover that Bill is dead. Do you have any idea why it's going to happen? I have no idea. I wish I had something to tell you. I wish I knew. I don't know. I don't. I can't think of anybody. We interviewed Nanette quite in detail. She had been up at a soccer game with her son and her daughter. Went to the store before coming home. All right, what were your activities today? I picked up some stuff for my son at a soccer game in Diamond Bar. 
and so I went up there. She planned to be with Bill that night. She knew that he was home that night and hadn't seen him for a few days because he had taken a trip to Las Vegas and had recently flown back and arrived that afternoon while she was at the soccer game. They find a note from Nanette telling Bill that she's at the game and will be home later. So she was very worried, especially when she found out that there were keys that were left at the scene that somebody knew and it got the keys to get into the house in order to kill Bill. And she made mention that she was supposed to be home at that time. That scared her. And she said that she was afraid that maybe she was the target and she just wasn't home. So she was very concerned. Since the investigation will be continuing all night, Nanette can't stay at the house. Luckily, Bill owns another house nearby on the beach. She tells the police that she'll stay there. As a matter of routine, investigators try to verify Nanette's story. They talk to her ex-husband, who confirms that she is at a soccer game with her son. But then he drops a bombshell. He told the police, you know, she told me not to mention this, but she was there with her boyfriend. And that kind of surprised the police because they thought that she didn't have a boyfriend. They thought that she was a fiancé to the victim. Newport Beach, California, is home to many wealthy and prominent citizens. Balboa Coves is a gated community located just off the coast highway and right on the waterfront. It's where Bill McLaughlin lives until his life is unexpectedly and brutally cut short on December 15th, 1994. It's also where Bill's fiance, Nanette Johnston, lives. Police find out that Nanette has a secret boyfriend. While she was engaged to marry Bill, they want to find out more about this guy. So they decided to stake out Nanette's second house, the one that's on the beach, to see if this other guy, Eric, would arrive. Eric actually arrived the, the day that they were watching. It was uh, sometime at night. Uh, he did arrive at that location, and they ended up actually doing a car stop on him and talking to him, and they found out who he was. The police asked him, you know, what's your relationship in, with Nanette? And he said, well, we're friends. We're pretty good friends. They discovered that he did have a, a small warrant for his arrest, a traffic warrant of some sort. And so they actually took him into custody for that warrant and then interviewed him in, in extent regarding this case. Eric Napuski is an ex-football player. He played in the NFL for a few different teams and also played in Spain and in Canada. But his entire career only lasted for a few years. Okay, I'm going to look at it now. I'm still security. I'm security work. I'm just helping out the nightclub because they have a problem with controlling things down there. The last one was shut down. He's working as a bouncer at a bar, and this particular bar is only a block away from Bill's house. They ask him if he ever uses guns. Hey, uh, do you have a CCW? No. Okay, do you do any army? No, I don't do any arms. Not even a uniform? No. Mm -hmm. I don't even have a sign on that takes, that takes at least six months. They asked him if he owned guns. He originally said no, he didn't. And then the interview goes on for probably another 45 minutes, and they circle back. Okay, you said you don't own any firearms at No, I, I bought one. Um, I haven't seen it so long. I uh, bought one in Dallas that I gave my dad as a 380. So first it's no guns, and then it's one. Eventually, though, they came to a point where he did admit that he had a Beretta 92F 9mm gun, but he had given it some time ago to one of his employees at a scene, and that guy had lost it, so that was, like, months ago. He keeps changing his story. One minute he's no guns at all, and now he's, well, I did have a 380, but I gave it to my dad, and I gave a Beretta 9mm to my employee. Now I don't have either of them. When the police officers actually contacted the employee that supposedly had the Beretta, uh, he said, no, I was never given a Beretta. It was a piece of crap Jennings 380, and Eric never paid me for the job, so I told Eric that the gun got stolen out of my car. And uh, he was eventually was able to get that 380 semi-automatic gun and give it to the police, so it was not the Beretta. He says his dad has the 380. But his employee has it? Or are there two 380s? 
Where is the Beretta he says he owns, and why does he claim it's missing? When this was going down, they were doing the ballistic testing on the bullets at the crime scene, and they discovered that the bullets that were there had been fired by one of 27 guns. One of those 27 guns was a Beretta 92F. So when they heard about this Beretta being possibly belonging to Eric, they definitely were interested in finding out where that gun was, since Eric told them he gave it to this employee, and that wasn't true. They then questioned Eric a lot about where that gun was. During his second interview with police, Eric is more defensive. Where is your night out? I have no idea. You have no idea? That's my statement. I don't want to wish you talk about well, that dude, you anymore. Know the last time you saw it? I don't want to talk about that anymore. No. This is the thing. No matter what happened to any guns, any time, anywhere, I didn't do anything wrong with anything. Okay? That's my statement. One of the things that's interesting about Naposky is he is he's incredibly forceful as he tells his story and convincing. And that's a pretty good friend of mine. Describe as a dating relationship, boyfriend, girlfriend. Uh, I would say dating, dating relationship. And it starts out, she's a girl I know, to basically the end of the interview, they learn that they're dating. Then he admits to maybe a little more. Girlfriend can mean a lot of things. I mean, do you think this is headed towards a serious relationship, a marriage? I hope it is. I hope it is, yeah. By the end of the first interview, he admits that he hoped to marry her. While looking into Bill's financial affairs, investigators discover some missing money. They got into the finances and they started to discover that there was money missing from some of his accounts. And they discovered that Nanette was taking small bits of money about a year earlier throughout the whole year of 1994 as it gained closer and closer to December. More and more money was being taken out of Bill's accounts and disappearing. As a matter of fact, the day before he was murdered, Nanette got a check from him for $250,000 with a signature that was determined not to be Bill's, even though it looks similar to it. It comes out in the investigation that Nanette and Eric frequently travel together. In the weeks leading up to Bill McLaughlin's murder, Nanette's sister got married on the East Coast, and she did not bring Bill McLaughlin as her date. She brought Eric Nikoski as her date. This doesn't seem to mesh with her plans to marry Bill. Does one of them decide that they need to get Bill out of the way? Well, they had suspicions, absolutely. And they brought those suspicions, but they just did not have enough to get over the hump to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. They needed more than what they had at that time. But they do have enough to charge Nanette with grand theft for stealing close to $500,000 from Bill. She pleads guilty and goes to jail for less than a year. And Bill McLaughlin's murder case goes stone cold. Bill McLaughlin is murdered in his own kitchen. Police suspect his fiance, Nanette, and her boyfriend, Eric, but can't prove it. Nanette is convicted of stealing some of Bill's money and spends a year in prison. The murder case goes cold. My name is Larry Montgomery. I've uh, been a police detective at the Irvine Police Department for most of my 29 years that I was at Irvine PD. And then I retired and went to the Orange County District Attorney's Office and was an investigator for them for about 14 years. And during that time, I was allowed to go into a cold case unit. It's 2008, 14 years since Bill McLaughlin's murder and Larry Montgomery is assigned to the case. It was a brand new unit for me to be in, and I was kind of like, well, what do I do with a cold case? What do I do to make difference uh, that the other detectives hadn't done, maybe? One of my advantages was I had time. I didn't have a caseload. I could take this case and do whatever I wanted and take as long as I wanted. When a case has gone unsolved for 14 years, another year or two can make all the difference. Better to take it slow and get it right. So what I did, is I had, that particular case, I think there was 63 tape-recorded interviews on cassette tapes. That's a lot of interviews. It was you know, hours and hours and hours, and uh, uh, hundreds of hours, basically. So I sat down and I started going through the tapes and taking copious notes on everything on all those tapes. 
Working a cold case is a lot like being an investigative journalist. You look for things that don't make sense, that don't add up, that raise a few questions, and then you dig deeper. And S' behavior on the night of the murder is one of those things. So you look at what she said when she's at home, when she comes home that day, she's mortified that her fiance has been murdered. She knows that the killer brought keys, had keys to this house. How did the killer get keys to this house? And then at the end, she goes, I'm not going to stay here. Don't worry. I'm not, you know, I know you have a day's worth of work to do here, but I'll go to our other place. The locks had not been changed on the beach house. She knows there's a killer on the loose with a key to one of the houses. Why wouldn't the killer have keys to both houses? Why would you even risk going there? Why would you even consider going there? She's brought her children to a place where a killer might show up, and she didn't even draw the curtains. And here's Nanette with a Christmas tree and her two little kids putting stuff on the Christmas tree. Okay, how scared is Nanette of the killer? She's in a place blocks from where the murder was. Who knows how the murderer got keys to that house? Does he have keys to this house? Was she the target? She said, I, I could have been the target. I've pissed off people in my life. So is she really afraid that she's the target? She's right there in the full view of anybody on the beach. Matter of fact, there's a man with a gun right outside. It's a police officer and she doesn't know that he's even out there. They're police officers, they're detectives. They know how to operate a firearm standing on the sand outside the beach house and she didn't even draw the curtains and didn't know they were there, which means her head is not on a swivel. She's not looking around for who, who this might be. Did she change the locks? She didn't do that. She didn't have security. She didn't have even Naposky move in with her to protect her from the killer. She goes to this place and is, doesn't have a care in the world. She's not looking out the window that the guy's going to get her. So that shows that she's not afraid of the killer. Otherwise, she wouldn't be there. Investigators get the sense that Nanette first became interested in Bill because of his money. What we discovered while investigating the case, Nanette had put an ad in a, back then it was a, a picture, like magazine, newspaper type material, and it had her in a negligee, kind of kneeling down on a bed. So it's a boudoir photo of her in negligee saying, I know how to take care of my man if he knows how to take care of me. And it's entitled Wealthy Men Only. And it appears that was the ad that uh, attracted Bill's attention. Nanette also stands to inherit money because of Bill's death. In addition to the money she's convicted of stealing, there's a bequest in the will and a life insurance policy. Regardless of guilt or innocence, Eric and Nanette do not get married and live happily ever after. His talk of love seems authentic, and his intentions to marry her are clear. He even writes a note in his book on January 1st, 1994, with the word propose, spelled wrong, but we know what he means. And she actually went and found another millionaire and married that guy, kind of dumped Eric, even though they were together for a while, but I don't think she really wanted Eric around. And uh, so they did separate and they went their separate ways. They embark on this very lavish lifestyle. Now, the thing about Nanette, she's all about money, right? So Eric Naposky had fulfilled his usefulness. They broke up because she has no real interest in some broke, washed-up football player. Eric, after the murder at some point, I think he went up to the Canadian Football League for a little while. He went up in Spain playing for the Barcelona Dragons, had a great season. You know, but it's kind of like being the home run king of the minor league team, you know, it's, he, he didn't make any real money. He meets a woman there and they have a couple of kids. Back in the US, he does some coaching at the University of New Haven, goes back into security work and then opens his own gym. Nanette not only finds herself another wealthy businessman to marry, she does it twice. She winds up getting married to a guy named Packard, uh, who uh, my understanding is made a bunch of money in real estate. And then they got divorced and then um, went up remarrying to a guy named Billy McNeil. So she went off and lived this very lavish, um, sort of quintessential Newport Beach housewife, um, Orange County. I mean, we've all seen the show, right? And she has another kid with each of them. It's now 15 years after the murder of Bill McLaughlin. And Larry gets his first big break when he stumbles onto something interesting at the end of one of the 63 tapes made all those years ago. Larry Montgomery, just he, he's incredible. He, he went through all the old tip logs of people who called in and he listened to the end of every tape. 
And it was a woman who was saying, yeah, you know, we were watching the news and we saw that Nanette Johnston ripped off this guy and was sent to jail. We just wanted you guys to know that uh, my husband uh, had a dealings with Nanette. Um, she came over to our house one day and was interested in maybe investing in my husband's company and uh, was willing to invest maybe two hundred or maybe a hundred thousand dollars in the company, but she wouldn't have the money till after the first of the year. Where does Nanette think that money is coming from? She's got no job. She's got no stocks. She has no sort of financial portfolio. The only way Nanette winds up flush with cash after the first of the year is if Bill McLaughlin dies. The woman wants to remain anonymous, and the call is abruptly cut off. No one tries to follow up at the time. I heard with really good earphones, I could hear her in the background say, Robert, they want to talk to you. It's not much to go on, but if Larry can find this Robert, it just might be the key to finding out what really happened to Bill McLaughlin 15 years ago. In 2008, cold case investigator Larry Montgomery begins looking into the 1994 murder of Bill McLaughlin. He discovers that an anonymous woman phones police with a tip about Nanette having suspicious dealings with her husband, a man named Robert. So all of a sudden it's like, this is interesting. Okay, I would love to know uh, who this guy is, but all we had was the type of company he had, which was biomedics, I think, and uh, he lived in Irvine, and his name was Robert. That's really all we had. Oh, he went to the gym with her. We know what gym she went to. So we went to the gym to see if we could find anybody with the name Robert in there. We found some Roberts, but we didn't find any that matched him. A thorough search in Irvine fails to yield any Roberts with a business license for a biomedical company. There are these books that they have that are called crisscross directories. In a crisscross directory, phone numbers are listed by numerical order rather than by name. You could look up a number and then find who belonged to that number instead of looking up a name and finding the phone number. So it was a reverse book. So I went there to look and see what numbers the net was calling and who she was calling. And there were two numbers that I could not find in those books. I almost left, and then I started realizing, well, this was December, so maybe I should be looking at 95, because maybe it's a new phone number in, the, in 94 somewhere. So I went back inside, went back and got 95 book, looked for those two numbers, and lo and behold, one of those numbers popped up, and it belonged to Robert located that person. We found out that he was, in fact, the right person. This is years and years later. And at that point, he was willing to talk with us. And he laid it all out to us. So he's now a new witness. And so that was one of our needed pieces of evidence so that we could file charges. Larry locates another witness from the past. During the initial investigation, a woman calls police and offers some information about Eric, but because she insists on remaining anonymous, they disregard what she has to say. So that was a person that I re-looked for years later, and I was able to find her and go talk with her, and she was able to open up to me and then agreeable to talk with us about everything that she knew back then in great detail. In 1994, Eric lives in an apartment complex, and he has a friend there named Susan. They used to talk to each other while they were lying next to the pool. But he was talking to her about his girlfriend, who he wanted to marry, and how his girlfriend was having a problem. She lived with a, uh, a rich man that was abusing her, sexually assaulting her. And he was very angry about this fact that his girlfriend was being sexually assaulted by this rich guy from Newport. Interestingly enough, he tells Susan that he wants to blow up the rich guy's plane. But she doesn't think much of it. She thinks it's just an angry guy talking. That is, until January, when she bumps into Eric and he tells her that the guy is dead. And she goes, oh my God, Eric, please tell me you didn't do that. And he kind of chuckled and said, maybe I did, maybe I didn't, maybe I paid somebody to do it. She checks the newspapers and the story about Bill's murder is everywhere. And she did call the police anonymously at first and just said, I wanted to tell you this information, but she was afraid that she would get killed by Naposky. So she gave them some information, but it wasn't enough for them to go uh, do anything with because she wasn't identifying herself totally. You can't blame her for being afraid. So that was another witness that we had that we were now able to get more information from, new information that helped us put the case together. So we've got these, these just 
gems of evidence that we were able to develop in the two years that we worked the case up that really, I think, made it overwhelming. Ballistics takes another look at the bullets that killed Bill. In this case, back in uh, 1994, the lab said that the bullets that killed Bill McLaughlin were shot by one of 27 guns. Ballistics had changed over the years, and they were able to determine that it's actually one of two guns could have shot these bullets, not one of 27. And lo and behold, one of those guns was a Beretta 92F. So given the interviews, um, that was hugely significant because we know Eric Naposky not only had a Beretta 92F, but he lied to the police multiple times about what happened to it. So that was big. March of 2009 is when we finally got enough put together that we could arrest them. And so what we chose to do was we thought that Nanette is the brains of this outfit. She had orchestrated it. She got Eric to kill for her. Uh, that's what we believed happened, and Eric was kind of uh, duped into it. Uh, he thought she was, he was going to marry Nanette, and Nanette did not marry him. He, once he did his job and killed, she basically tried to get rid of him. And so we were monitoring her, and what we wanted to do was get Eric into custody. We wanted to give Eric Naposky a chance to sign on with the good guys. We actually set up two teams, and the, the plan was one team would go and arrest uh, Naposky in Connecticut, take him to a police department, and put in what's called a cold call to Nanette Johnson and see if he'd be willing to help the police nail her down and get her to make some sort of admission. He was not interested in that at all. He said, he didn't do it, she didn't do it, this is all bull, and so he would not participate in that whatsoever. So we were disappointed in that because we thought that would be a good way to get Nanette. If Eric won't come clean and testify against Nanette, do investigators have enough to convict either of them? Cold case investigators amass enough new evidence to arrest Eric Naposky for the murder of Bill McLaughlin. They're hoping to turn Eric on his suspected accomplice, Nanette, and get his help to incriminate her. He refuses. Even though they mostly have circumstantial evidence, they go ahead and arrest Nanette anyway. They're still hoping that Eric will come to his senses and testify against her. On June 19, 2011, Eric goes on trial for the murder of Bill McLaughlin. By putting him on trial first, they're hoping to wear him down and show him how much trouble he's in. They want him to cut a deal. The prosecution reveals that Bill was shot six times in a special pattern. And then it was a bang, 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 bang. So it was six shots, but in successions of two. That's a close combat shooting technique that people are trained to do. It's essentially you shoot twice, you re-aim, you shoot twice, you re-aim, you shoot twice. Turns out Eric Naposky had had formal firearms training where the instructor went through that technique within six months of the murder. The killer has keys to the front door and gate of Bill's house. The owner of a hardware store testifies that a month or two before the murder, he made some keys for Eric. He thinks that he could have possibly made the key that was found in the front door. Not only did he get two keys cut in my store, but he also asked if I could make a silencer for a nine millimeter pistol. And we call that a clue. Eric claims that on his way to work on the night of the murder, he gets a page from one of his managers at the nightclub. I believe I was in my truck at the time. I went to a phone and I called him. I was in my truck. A payphone? Uh-huh. I went to a payphone and made the call. I know. How about we go look at my phone bill and see what time exactly I made that call? And maybe then, if I made the call at a certain time, you guys could leave me alone. Defense claims Eric uses a calling card at precisely 8.52 p.m., making it impossible for him to get to the house and shoot Bill by the time of death at 9.11 p.m. The only problem is that in the 15 years since the murder, Eric has lost proof of this phone call. The company is out of business and there are no records. The prosecution is able to prove that Eric was able to get from where he claims he made the phone call to the site of the murder in time for him to do it. One of the things that we did is we 
we drove that over and over and over again. We, we drove it um, on the calendar anniversary of it. We drove it on, we, we did every incarnation of that drive, assuming that Eric Naposky was correct. No matter how you slice or dice that drive, there's plenty of time for Eric Naposky to have committed that murder. A person could walk from the bar where Eric worked to Bill's house in exactly two minutes and 32 seconds. It's 136 yards. You can hit it with an 8-iron in the game of golf. I mean, it's right across the channel. So Eric Naposky has himself driving directly to the murder scene before the murder. Whether he stops to make a call or not is irrelevant. According to the prosecution's version of events, Eric arrives at the house and uses the keys he cut to unlock the gate and the front door. He uses the gun he bought and lied about to shoot Bill in three two-shot bursts, thanks to his security guard training. Then, he walks to work in two minutes and 32 seconds. Eric chooses not to testify in his own defense. On July 14, 2011, Eric Naposky is found guilty of murder. Eric isn't sentenced right away because prosecutors are still hoping that he'll testify against Nanette. In January 2012, Nanette's trial begins. The prosecution paints a picture of a younger woman who gets involved with an older rich man and then conspires with her boyfriend to murder him for financial gain. Bill has made Nanette the beneficiary of a million dollar life insurance policy. He also appointed her as the trustee over the bulk of his estate. He made a will leaving her $150,000, a car, and the use of a beach house which she was able to stay in for up to a year after his death. Defense points out that Bill is worth over $20 million and therefore more valuable to Nanette alive than dead. Bill's accountant testifies about Nanette stealing from Bill. As she steals more and more money and the amounts get larger, she runs a greater risk of being caught. The problem is that Nanette was about to be on the street with nothing because Bill McLaughlin was going to find out about Eric Naposky or Bill McLaughlin was going to find out about the thefts. Nanette's ex-husband takes the stand. He characterizes Nanette as a habitual liar. He says that she claims that she graduated from Arizona State, but he doesn't think she even graduated from high school. She cheats on him throughout the marriage, even leaving a note on a rich guy's car hoping to date him. She brings one date to her son's soccer match, but then meets Eric at the game and goes home with him. On the night of the murder, Nanette and Eric leave the soccer game early because, quote, Eric has an appointment. An appointment? Isn't he on his way to work? She asks her ex to take care of the kids and cancels her weekend's visit with them, almost like she knows something is going to happen. She drops Eric off and then goes shopping. Why? She needs an alibi. Because she knows Eric's appointment is to go over to Bill's house, use the keys he had made to let himself in, and then shoot Bill with the Beretta he purchased. Nanette and Naposky and Nanette's two children took a trip back to Naposky's house, his parents' house, and actually stayed with them for almost a week. All four of them went to New York and saw the sights of New York, and then they went up to the north part of the United States and went to Nanette's sister's wedding. And they have pictures of the kids and Nanette and Naposky actually at this wedding. Bill was close to those kids. Those kids came over every other week and at his house, and he was close to them. He took them on his boat. He took them in his plane. They have pictures of him on the couch uh, with the kids in, under both arms. And yet those kids just spent uh, two weeks with Eric Naposky and her mom as if that's her boyfriend. That meant that those two kids could never come to Bill's house and see Bill alive again. Because if they did, they would say, oh, we had a great trip. We went with mommy's boyfriend and we went to these places in New York and they couldn't have that happen so those kids never could see Bill again. They either expect him to be dead soon or they know they need to make it happen. Otherwise Bill will dump her and she'll lose all that money. And so those are the kind of things that once you get those things and you present those in front of a jury it's very powerful stuff. And what we did in the trials at the end of the trials we presented maybe seven or eight things that we found that were really powerful. We have like 60 of those things that we've found, and we give seven of them to the jury and then tell the jury to go back into the jury room and listen to those interviews again. Listen to them again, especially the suspect interviews, and I'll bet you you'll find more. There's a power to discovering things for yourself. 
it can be far more effective than being told. On January 23, 2012, after four hours of deliberation, the jury finds Nanette guilty of first-degree murder. She is sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. This was one of the first cold cases that I worked in the unit, and it was very fulfilling to realize that we could find evidence that we didn't find before because we didn't know to look. And I was very happy with the results of this one. Bill's daughters were there. It was a, a very emotional experience for them. Uh, they really thought that this there would never be justice in their father's case. And so it was uh, uh, very powerful for them. Their, their son, the one that had some physical problems, he had passed away. All they had left were the, the two daughters, and they were um, very happy that eventually some justice was served. We're talking almost two decades after their father has been murdered for the most banal of all reasons, for money. So when the jury came back and turns out they were a good group, they got it, they followed the law, they followed the evidence, and they made the right decision. It's one of those things that makes you want to you know, keep being a prosecutor forever. Michelle Despain comes home to take care of some business with the family real estate company. The house is found in disarray, and Mark Despain is dead. She walked in, and Mark was laying on the floor in the kitchen in a pool of blood. The gunshot wound to the face would have been the kill shot, so to speak. Very graphic. Horrific. Horrific crime scene. Could it have been a botched burglary? Could it have been a botched robbery? Two bullet casings are found at the scene, belonging to a 380 caliber pistol. But who pulled the trigger? Jonesboro, Arkansas. Home of Arkansas State University, Jonesboro is known as the city of churches, with more than 70 churches in a city of 70,000. With rice farms to the west and cotton to the east, Jonesboro is an economic hub for the region. Jonesboro is a fairly large city. It has the small town qualities of you still have mom and pop stores, things of that nature. It's a nice town to live in, a nice town to raise a family, right dab center in the, the Bible Belt. It's a town that's it's experiencing serious growing pains. Crimes in Jonesboro, Arkansas was just unknown. We didn't have anything. You used to could leave your doors unlocked and have your windows up in the evening with your attic fan on. It was just a very hometown environment, yet big enough that you had everything that you need. In an affluent suburb of Jonesboro, Mark Despain runs a real estate business. He was an entrepreneur and he had goals and he was a great family man and loved his children and loved to, to travel. He was involved in the real estate business twofold. One, doing appraisal work, you know, for financial institutions, lending agencies, and then also owned real estate, you know, rental property. Mark was the type of worker that you just, you couldn't buy enough of. He had initially had started working with his mom and dad at their appraisal company and felt strongly enough to be able to open up his own business. His wife, Michelle, helps out while working a day job at the bank. Michelle and Mark were actually high school sweethearts. Went their separate ways for a while and 
ended up getting back together. Mark is 19 and Michelle is 18 when they marry. Michelle has a daughter from a previous relationship and is pregnant with their son when they marry in 1996. We knew that she was very impoverished growing up. She come from a poor family. She met Mark, they got married and became wealthy, established a, a real estate business. Mark and Michelle did buy some properties, and I think, however, they did have help from Jack and Tana, which is Mark's parents, and I think a lot of that is where some of the issues come into play. Maybe their family was giving them some financial help, and it wasn't going toward the bills and things like it should, and that became a questionable thing is where was the money going. Mark and his father, Jack, have a falling out, but it's an explosive discovery on Jack Despain's cell phone that sends the family into a spiral. Michelle discovers topless photos of her teenage daughter on Jack's phone. The discovery tears the family apart. Uh, there had been accusations from Mark's daughter um, alleging some inappropriate photographs that Mark's dad had possessed. It caused a rift in the family with Mark's mother ultimately leaving her husband there for a while. Jack and Tana did have words and did actually have issues over that. Because Tana, again, being the mom and wanting to be supportive of her son, also had her husband to understand and be there for. So I think it was extremely tough on their entire family. Initially, Tana Despain, who was Jack's wife, left Jack based upon the allegations. Tana wasn't initially cut off but then they got back together and Mark cut both dad, mom, sister, family off. And to my knowledge, and based upon everything I've received, they had not talked to, to Mark in four or five years. Michelle's father, Carl, does odd jobs, including rent collection for Mark and Michelle's rental business when the images are discovered on Jack's phone. Carl Kelly kind of just did odd jobs for Mark and their family, and even maybe Jack at some point. I don't think Carl was the hold down a job type of person. He would work for the apartment complex, do some maintenance and things like that. I think that Jack held a grudge against Carl and Michelle and those members of the family that they had, in his belief, turned his son against him and his wife and his family. Whereas Carl had a belief that, that Jack was a child molester. I know that there was a lot of bad blood between their families. August 24th, 2011. Mark meets Michelle on her lunch break from her job at the bank. They go to the local taco shop. For dessert, they get frozen yogurt across the street from the taco shop. It's the last time Michelle would see her husband alive. Michelle returns to the bank from lunch at about 1.30 that afternoon. When Mark returns home, he doesn't realize that he is not alone. At about three o'clock that afternoon, Michelle receives a phone call from her father, Carl, saying that the gas bills haven't been paid at several homes and the gas has been turned off. She needs to go home, grab the bills, and pay them. When Michelle returns home, she walks in on a scene straight from a wife's worst nightmare. She walked in through the garage door into her residence and the first room you come to is the kitchen, and Mark was laying on the floor in the kitchen in a pool of blood. Horrified, Michelle hits the panic button on her home alarm and runs outside to call 911. 911, where's your emergency? <laughs> Oh, my God, my husband! I just came home from work. I just came home from my husband. 
What happened to your husband, ma'am? Oh, ma'am, I need you to take a deep breath, okay, and tell me what's going on. I don't know. I just came out from work. Police rush to the scene. Could someone still be lurking in the Despain home? They come in through the garage and find Mark Despain laying on the floor in a pool of blood. There's no pulse. He's deceased. They try to clear the house because they don't know if someone could still be inside the house. A lot of blood, I meaning that he bled out. This guy bled out. After he was shot, he pumped all his blood out of him. Mark had one gunshot wound to the left underarm area. Uh, he also had a gunshot wound to the face. The gunshot wound to the face would have been the the kill shot, so to speak. Very graphic, horrific, horrific crime scene. And when they determine that there is no one inside the house, they, they look in certain rooms. In the living room, it appears that it has been, you know, surged. There's things that are out of order, things that are thrown around. In the master bedroom, there are drawers open. It would at least appear to be a crime scene that could it have been a boxed burglary, could have been a boxed robbery. Who killed Mark Despain? Was it a botched burglary? His wife Michelle tells police she suspects someone. Closer to home. Jonesboro, Arkansas. High school sweethearts Mark and Michelle Despain run a real estate business together. August 24th, 2011. Michelle Despain is horrified to discover her husband Mark on the kitchen floor. She calls 911. What happened to your husband, ma'am? When police bring Michelle in to take a statement, she retells the gruesome scene she's just witnessed. I looked over, and there was stuff on the floor, and I looked over, and he was laying on the floor. And I couldn't see his face because he was kind of looking this way, but, but there was blood all behind his back, running all the way back behind him. I screamed his name and I, and I went over there and I climbed kind of his leg and, and I screamed his name again and he didn't, he didn't move at all. And I got scared because of the stuff in the floor. I thought somebody might still be in the house. Detectives find two shell casings near Mark's body that correspond to the two bullet wounds. The imprint on the shell casing clearly indicates that a 380 caliber automatic round was used. The gun that was used was a semi-automatic, uh, very common, very readily available. I believe it was a 380 caliber, smaller, compact type of gun. 380 caliber pistols are commonly used as concealed carry weapons. They fit under a waistband and can be easily hidden. Detectives are now looking for a 380 pistol as the murder weapon. They search the house to see if the weapon may have come from inside the Despain home. As more law enforcement arrives, they canvass the neighborhood and investigate whether this was a burglary. Police find a window screen removed, but it doesn't look pried open. When you went into the master bedroom, there were dresser drawers that had been pulled out, uh, magazines that had been taken out and kind of fanned where they would be seen. In the closet, I think there was a armoire that had been knocked over a large amount of high dollar electronic equipment, televisions, computers, things of that nature that weren't, they weren't disturbed. Detectives find a hunting rifle left behind as well. We weren't finding any signs of forced entry, nothing appeared to be left unlocked, things of that nature. Outside the home, Carl Kelly confronts Jack Despain and the family feud reaches a boiling point. Jack Despain somehow receives notification that it's occurred and he comes out there and there's a confrontation at least with those two
two yelling at each other at the scene. Police bring everyone in for questioning, including Mark's estranged father, Jack Despain. There were lots of pointing of fingers. Of course, Michelle's family was pointing their fingers toward Jack. Jack, obviously, was trying to grieve as a father and trying to deal with having to kind of fight for his own life as far as he just lost his son. It doesn't take long for investigators to believe that Jack is legitimately upset about his son's murder. Jack Despain was very distraught during his, his interview. I mean, you see it on TV, you read about it, and you never think about being in your family. <laughs> Meanwhile, neighbors of the Despains tell police they see a blue Mercedes in the neighborhood they've never seen before. The nature of the neighborhood isn't one that you would just be driving through. I mean, if you were going there, you were either going there as a destination or you were lost. Or you were there to do something, you know, illegal. Those things stood out to people and they, they noticed this older blue Mercedes vehicle that had driven through the neighborhood slowly. Witnesses tell police they remember seeing a man in a green striped polo shirt walking through the neighborhood that day. They lived in an area that if there was a vehicle out of place or someone was there that shouldn't belong, that we've got the type of community in Jonesboro that we recognize these things. And I think that they were seen, there were cars there seen, and actually there was uh, reports that there was um, a man seen there, basically stalking out the place. Nothing is adding up for investigators. They suspect it's a staged burglary. Yet, they have eyewitness accounts of a strange car and a possible burglar. The motive for their prime suspect, Jack Despain, isn't holding up. On August 28th, family, friends, and police attend Mark Despain's funeral. It just brings out the realization that your friend is gone. Someone that was so loved and so cherished by so many could just be gone. Police notice something peculiar. Mark's family has not been invited. There definitely was a, a grudge there, and you could you could tell that even the with the death that that grudge wasn't going away. In fact, Michelle forces Mark's parents to hold a separate funeral service entirely after the visitation. At the visitation, you could you could see um, just the behavior of Michelle and Carl were just, it was just, again, odd behavior. Is there more to the family feud for police to uncover? Does the bad blood put someone familiar to Mark behind the murder weapon? Jonesboro, Arkansas. Law enforcement tries to nail down who has killed real estate entrepreneur and father of three, Mark Despain. After nude photos are found on Jack Despain's phone of Mark and Michelle's teenage daughter, a feud engulfs the family. Police suspect the house has been made to look as though it was burglarized, but they can't find any sign of forced entry. During the investigation, uh, we saw there at the crime scene, a lot of unpaid bills, late notices, things of that nature laying around. Investigators explore the possibility of financial motivations leading to Mark's murder. They start with Jack Despain, but don't get very far. I believe that early on that, that Jack had an alibi that they checked out, that he was either, you know, on a roof or working on a roof or someplace, and again, during this period of time when they're looking hard at him, inroads are made when they bring in 
Johnny Hubbard and Terrence Barker. A tip from a confidential informant leads police to two new suspects in the case. There was a tip. There was a gentleman by the name of Quelo that had uh, had been bragging, talking about he had killed someone for for money. And they're saying, "Hey, watch the news tonight. You know, you'll see what I was involved in." We were able to identify Quelo as being Terrence Barker through uh, records that we had on file. Police search the Barker's residence and find clothing that matches the description of the man eyewitnesses saw in the neighborhood. Forensic tests are conducted on the clothing that detects the presence of hemoglobin, even if the clothing has been washed. It detects hemoglobin on two different items belonging to Terrence Barker. A routine traffic stop lands Terrence in the county jail for unrelated offenses. Police question him in the murder of Mark Despain, but he denies everything. I suppose being talking to dude, you talking about Johnny Hubbard or whatever, or being in the car, or went up to some other place or whatever that you was talking about to get in the vehicle with the other dude or whatever. Yes, sir, at the church parking lot. Oh, have the people I don't even know that you even talking about, I don't even know them. Or she, I know of Johnny for like killing anybody or whatever, like you're saying. I did not. When Johnny Hubbard is brought in for questioning, he tells police that he's the one who hired Terrence Barker to shoot Mark Despain. Barker is interrogated a second time the next day. This time, he's presented with all of the evidence they've got that points to him as the trigger man. And he knows that police are talking to Johnny Hubbard. Quelo gives up the job saying that he did it for seven to ten thousand dollars. He looked as, as a point for easy money, so that's why he did it. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, yeah, he was like seven or ten feet, I don't understand. So see, I'm kind of figuring, well, if they wanted to do a kill, and they would just wait on the insurance money, how much would the insurance money probably work if they was probably not get paid? in order to even come up with the, the scheme. Police connect phone calls made from Carl Kelly's phone to the phones of Terrence Barker and Johnny Hubbard. Both live close to each other. Johnny Hubbard is a tenant of Mark and Michelle Despain. What appears happens is that Carl Kelly makes contact with Johnny Hubbard, who's a tenant and one of the people that he would be collecting money from, and knows that Johnny Hubbard has a past criminal history, drug dealing, other things of that nature. And it leads to, at some point in time, a discussion, do you know anybody that could perform a job for me? You know, anybody that would, you know, could go kill somebody. Carl Kelly threatens Johnny Hubbard with eviction if he doesn't help with this murder plot. With mounting evidence and the testimony of Johnny Hubbard and Terrence Barker, police believe Carl Kelly is the one who offers to pay Terrence Barker to murder Mark Bain and make it look like a botched robbery. And there's a belief that he uses Mark's own gun to shoot him. What kind of gun is it? Police are confident the 380 shell casings found at the scene belong to a weapon Carl Kelly provides to Terrence Barker. The gun, I guess, was in, in the cabinet thing or whatever, because he went to the cabinet thing and was reaching, messing with the stuff or whatever, and, and came out with it. Carl Kelly knows Mark Despain owns the pistol because Carl arranges for him to own it. Earlier, Mike Kelly, which would be Carl Kelly's brother, has a gun just like Carl. They both bought them at the same time at a, a local gun shop. Al's lock and keys, that he had a firearms dealership and sold them. Supposedly when Mark was talking to Carl and he said he really liked that gun, he calls up 
his brother and says, hey, do you want to get rid of your gun? You know, I've got a buyer for it, or hey, Mark would like to get it. Sometimes good is coming through. I appreciate you coming up here and everything. Under the circumstances, I know it's... Did you find the gun? That was not there. I've got one just like it. Me and Mike bought one at the same time. He yeah. sold this to Mark. Right. And that's why Mark, Mark couldn't never figure out how to break it down to clean it. Like I told him. He's always having to show him. Right. Yeah. My right. fingerprint's on the gun. I would describe this as a very cold-blooded homicide. When detectives interview Carl Kelly, he immediately describes the rift between Father Jack and son Mark. Jack, Jack Despain told Mark, he said, I will ruin you and your family. He said, for you accusing me of this. He said, I will see you ruined. I've heard him say that. Family's going to be, uh... If I was going to point a finger at anybody, if that's what you're asking, I'd point at Jack Despain. I don't believe Carl was, was a nice guy, but I believe that Carl, Carl believed that he was going to walk away with this deal. Basically, he was looking out for Carl. Carl was going to receive, he was going to receive some money out of this, possibly some, some steady income. That steady income would come from life insurance policies, covering Mark with Michelle Despain as the loan beneficiary. There were two life insurance policies, and she was the beneficiary on both. There were two separate policies in the amount of $500,000. Terrence Barker tells police it was Carl Kelly who offered to pay him between seven and $10,000 to kill Mark. The side of the fact that when I get the job, on the job done, whatever I get, the one is the job done. Investigators now need to take a cold, hard look at the person who benefits most from Mark's murder, his wife, Michelle. To detectives, the body language and reactions of Michelle Despain don't seem right. I don't know about you, but I would not be cheerful and smiling during an interview where I just lost my husband. The detective conducting the interview questions whether Michelle is forcing herself to cry as she accuses Jack Despain of the murder. All of her behavior is noted as unusual. She didn't show any emotion. Um, she appeared to be trying to, to make herself cry, so to speak. Uh, but there was a very, the, the emotions shown by her weren't real. We've said that many times, as long as we all had each other, it didn't matter about the other stuff. Just it didn't matter about. if his dad got mad because we let, some, let that property go. Because we've tried to sell the property too, and his dad won't sell it. Detectives believe Mark and Michelle's marriage is not a happy one. Once we learned of the affair that Michelle was having, we learned that there were there was money coming out, Michelle paying for different bills, buying food, things of that nature for her boyfriend. There were speculations about the affair. And so I personally have no doubt that he was aware of the affair and Maybe not necessarily going down the side of divorce at the moment, but I think at some point it was in his head to do that. A deteriorating marriage, financial troubles, and two large life insurance policies are plenty of motive for law enforcement to believe Michelle wants Mark dead. But a motive isn't evidence. Detectives need a smoking gun to connect Michelle to the murder-for-hire plot. Two 380 automatic bullets enter Mark Despain's body, one in his side and another between his eyes. The gun may have belonged to Mark himself. Another eyewitness would come forward who claims that Carl Kelly approaches him on two separate occasions to shoot Mark between the eyes, including once just a week before Mark is killed. 
Despite Terence Barker's testimony saying otherwise, ballistic testing on Mark's forehead confirms that he is shot, point blank, right between the eyes. Michelle Despain's father, Carl Kelly, puts the gun into the hands of a hired killer, Terence Barker. Now, investigators need to find out if Carl Kelly is conspiring with Michelle Despain to kill her own husband. They establish a motive and they see suspicious behavior, but those things aren't evidence of Michelle's involvement. Michelle tells police she receives a call from Carl at around 3 o'clock, August 24th, to deal with unpaid gas bills. She says several homes have had the gas cut off and she has to go home to retrieve bills and pay them. There is indeed a stack of unpaid bills in a bundle on the kitchen floor. But there's a note on the bills. Got extensions. Pay on or before September 3rd, 2011. She said she had to go home to pick up something, but it was also during the same time that school would have been letting out. So that led me to believe that she was needed to hurry up and get home to maybe keep the children from finding him. Not only did she pry him away for lunch, but in order to give the intruders a couple of more minutes, she also asked him to go get ice cream. August 31st, 2011. Police tell Michelle Despain they have arrested the suspected trigger man, Terrence Barker, and the man who drove him to the house, Johnny Hubbard. And they inform Michelle that they intend to arrest her father. My father? Yes, ma'am. Uh, your father will be arrested for murder. Uh, I have uh, all the information, all the evidence Not I need. Mark. No, ma'am. Your father, Carl Kelly, is responsible for setting this up partly to have your husband killed. I don't believe that. This, I had the tenant call me, call me this morning and tell me that. I did not believe it. thought it was another rumor. It's not a rumor, Michelle. There's been rumors already. That I know. There's been thousands of rumors out there. Carl Kelly, not Jack Despain, is charged with capital murder. Police arrest Carl Kelly and retrieve a 380 caliber pistol from his home. They conduct ballistics testing on the gun, but the results come back inconclusive. Police go over the events of the day with Michelle one more time. Meanwhile, they do some more digging into the contents of her phone. The phone that belonged to Michelle was forensically examined there at the Jonesboro Police Department. It was the text messages that we were seeing as far as the phone records were not in the phone itself and it appeared that it had been deleted. Um, it was several months down the line that the phone was forwarded to the FBI and with the help of some newer technology, they were able to recover those text messages. The day of the murder, it says, it has to be today. Sending a message to her dad that says, can't deal with it any longer it has to be today. So, they s basically, the dad texts back and says, keep me posted, keep me in the loop as far as your time frame goes. She was communicating with Carl, giving Carl basically play-by-play -play details of where she was, uh, where Mark was, he was asking her before that, can you get him to lunch? She's giving play-by-play -play details to him of when they're leaving the restaurant, details including when he's on his way home. Police believe Michelle receives a text when the job is done so she can get to the body and discover it before her children get home from school around three. It appeared that Michelle wanted out that she couldn't take it any longer. Her motive was in this, that she was going to obtain this, this large amount of money, continue her way of living that she was comfortable with. 
They knew what they were going to do. Kill him. And then they were going to get the insurance money. So the father and the, the daughter conspired. And then they get these these poor slobs to go do the dirty work for them. Once the, the evidence was recovered from Michelle's cell phone and with all the other investigative findings, we were able to obtain a warrant for her arrest. Nine months after Mark Despain is killed, police arrest Michelle Despain and charge her with capital murder. Police believe they have cracked the case, but the search for justice doesn't end with an arrest. August 24th, 2011. Mark Despain is found murdered by his wife, Michelle. Phone records show Michelle and her father, Carl Kelly, are in constant contact the day of Mark's murder. Finally, Michelle is charged and police can put together a complete timeline of what happened. With financial problems, a failing marriage, and an affair, law enforcement believes Michelle wants a way out. She enlists the help of her father, Carl Kelly. Carl threatens Johnny Hubbard with eviction unless he procures a hired killer for Carl. Johnny finds Terrence Barker to be the trigger man. On August 24th, Michelle texts Carl saying, it has to be today. Carl contacts Hubbard to make the arrangement. Right before Mark did go home, they had met for lunch and then we found that Mark and Michelle had went to a local frozen yogurt shop after their lunch. Meanwhile, Johnny Hubbard drives Terrence Barker to the Despain residence. Waiting for them there is Carl Kelly. He was there the whole time. He had met with Carl Kelly. Um, he was supposed to receive a certain amount of money. Uh, he was taken to the house by Carl. Carl let him in through the garage. Uh, Terrence laid in wait inside the house uh, in a laundry room. Takes him in the house, shows him that, that Mark will come in that door, that he usually, as a habit, sets his stuff up on the counter, his wallet, keys, you know, he'll pick up the, the rent collections or whatever else may be there, mail, something else. Did he tell you who he was texting? Did he tell you? Yes, sir. Who did he tell you he was The dude was white. Play by play. Play by play. What they were doing. Mark had one gunshot wound, I believe, to the left, maybe underarm area. Uh, he also had a gunshot wound to the face. The gunshot wound to the face would have been the, the kill shot, so to speak. Based on the gunshot wounds that he was suffering from, this was an intentional act. Mark Despain had been executed. The items that were in disarray did appear as though it, it was staged to look like some sort of burglary. Terrence Barker flees the scene on foot. He tosses the gun, which is provided to him by Carl Kelly, into the back of a red truck. In order to make sure her three children don't discover Mark's body laying in a pool of blood, Michelle rushes home under the pretense of having to collect unpaid gas bills. Both Carl and Michelle point the finger at Mark's father, Jack, but his alibi is strong and his motive weak. In fact, Jack is cleared of any wrongdoing in the cell phone incident with his granddaughter, which tore the family apart five years earlier. They got school involved, got the county involved, state, and I went in and I took a polygraph test and I was, uh, I was cleared. In the end, law enforcement gets the evidence to charge Michelle Despain with capital murder. Johnny Hubbard is charged with hindering apprehension, a charge in Arkansas that is similar to obstruction of justice in other states. Johnny Hubbard was a facilitator. He was a go-between between, between Carl Kelly and provided the shooter, Terrence Barker. Terrence Barker avoids the death penalty and pleads guilty to first-degree murder. Terrence Barker was the shooter, there's no doubt. And that he 
waited inside a closet and shot and killed Mark to Spain. Michelle's father, Carl Kelly, who arranges for the murder and gives Terrence Barker the gun that kills Mark, also avoids the death penalty with a guilty plea of first-degree murder. But Michelle, charged with capital murder, which could lead to the death penalty, is offered a plea deal from prosecutors because of a weakness in their case. The prosecutors had learned of this new case law that had come out, and they knew that if those text messages were to be suppressed and removed from uh, evidence in the proceedings, that would affect the outcome. Well, they, they obtained the warrants, but it was our basis that they obtained the warrants improperly because there should have been a new affidavit specifically stating why this phone needs to be searched again. You know, what has led them to need this additional search? They, they got an initial search warrant. They didn't find these things that they were allegedly looking for. And so each time they went into this phone, they needed a new search warrant. That was our argument. And if that argument was made and we prevailed, then they may not have enough evidence to go forward. She was charged with capital murder. She ended up pleading to three counts of hindering apprehension. Hindering apprehension, the same charge that Johnny Hubbard pleads guilty to. However, Michelle pleads guilty to three counts of it. Each charge comes with a 10-year sentence. But with good behavior, Michelle Despain can be free in as little as five years. In the eyes of the law, justice was served. But what about the eyes of the family? Our blood starts boiling when we talk about the plea agreement. Because we basically feel that she got away with murder. At the end of the day, she was arrested and we did our job as law enforcement and the prosecutors they they did their job the best that they could um, although she wasn't found guilty of murder she didn't plead guilty to murder based on everything that we had at that time and, and what we were learning that was a better outcome than her not ever being found guilty of anything.